Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a joint hearing of the City Council's Health Committee, Transportation Committee, and Parks Committee, and I'm pleased to be joined by Chair of the Transportation Committee, Udanis Rodriguez, as well as Acting Chair of the Parks Committee, Andy Cohen, and we are especially excited to be joined by the Speaker of the City Council, Corey Johnson. Um, and I'm just going to very quickly acknowledge uh, the members who are here, and then I'll pass it over to the speaker. Uh, we're joined by uh, Councilmember Debbie Rose, Councilmember Antonio Reynoso, Councilmember Peter Ku, Councilmember Bob Holden, and I acknowledge our chairs who are here as well. And now I'll pass it over to Speaker Corey Johnson. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Levine. I want to thank uh, Chairs Rodriguez. Uh, Cohen and Levine for holding this joint hearing today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council. And I'd like to start off by thanking uh, all of my colleagues. Uh, today, we will be considering a package of legislation regarding Hart Island and the city's public burial process. We expect to hear from several city agencies. We're here. Thank you for being here, including the New York City Parks Department, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Dina, it's good to see you. Uh, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Transportation, and the Human Resource Administration. I look forward to hearing from the administration as well as advocates, many who have been working to improve Hart Island for years, and I want to thank those advocates that are here today that spent so much time shining light on this really important issue. Hart Island has served as the city's public cemetery, sometimes referred to as a potter's field, for 150 years. Hart Island is believed to be the final resting place for over one million New Yorkers, one million people, more than the entire population of Westchester County. Many of the people laid to rest on Hart Island were poor or marginalized by society. Many had preventable or untimely deaths, and even today, those who are buried in Hart Island are dying younger than the general population. Many died as a result of stigmatized diseases, such as AIDS. In fact, there is a strong possibility that Hart Island is the largest cemetery in the United States of America for individuals who passed away during the height of the AIDS epidemic, when many were turned away from proper care and denied the option of a private burial. Many of those buried in Hart Island died as infants or were born stillborn. Some individuals were buried on Hart Island despite having planned and financially prepared for a private burial. And some have family and friends out there searching to find the final resting place of their loved one. Currently, the Department of Correction oversees Hart Island's operation. And DOC staff and individuals incarcerated at Rikers are responsible for burials and upkeep of the island. The remains of our fellow New Yorkers are buried in trenches that can fit 500 adults or 1,000 infants and fetal remains. We are the only city in the world that has a public cemetery like this one. Over the past several years, actions have been taken to improve the island's visitation policies and the accessibility of its burial records. Notably, and I want to thank the Department of Correction, notably DOC staff receives many compliments for their work on the island by family and friends of the deceased. And it is clear that the Department of Correction takes pride in their work. However, more must be done. Today, I have two objectives, to discuss the future of the city's public burial process, as well as the current and future con physical condition of Hart Island itself. While the island is an idyllic location, the visitation process and its current upkeep is a major issue. Families and friends who wish to visit Hart Island feel as if they are visiting a prison. They are set, there are set times and dates when they can travel to, to City Island and then take the Department of Transportation ferry across to the cemetery. They must register ahead of time. They must be escorted by DOC staff. They must present a photo ID, and they must surrender their possessions to DOC staff, including their phones, for the duration of their visit. Once they are on the island, uh, they may only be allowed to visit a gazebo and not the graves of the loved ones that they wish to visit. And if they are permitted for a graveside visit and their loved one is recently deceased, there is a chance that they will visit an open trench instead of a burial plot. They will see multiple dilapidated buildings. They will also likely see trash strewn along the shorelines and overgrown patches of land. I visited Hart Island late last year, and I experienced this firsthand. 
And as an HIV positive man, it was emotional and an overwhelming experience for me. It is clear to me that we can do much better, much better for the people who are buried on Heart Island. And I feel an obligation to help. I can see why so many who wish to visit a loved one may experience anxiety or decline to visit at all. While I did see issues with the island's upkeep, I also saw incredible potential. The visiting policies, burial process, and general maintenance of the island can be improved. The shorelines, which like all other islands under Parks Department jurisdiction, collect debris and they can be cleaned. The buildings, like many other before them, can be demolished. Our public cemetery can and should be just as well kept as any private cemetery. The island itself is large and the natural setting of the cemetery is unique and unlike any other in New York City. With proper upkeep, I can see friends and family finding peace knowing their loved one is on a quiet island located in the middle of Long Island Sound. And while I was impressed by DOC's passion and eagerness to work with us during our tour, I know that they are not the appropriate agency to oversee this sensitive and important work. I know that our Parks Department is simply better equipped to oversee proper maintenance of the island and ensure that it is a safe and peaceful place to visit or be buried. Importantly, if parks were to have jurisdiction over Hart Island, then visitation policies could be loosened and simplified. As a city, we must also examine how individuals end up receiving a public burial. In 2019, in 2018 alone, over 1,200 New Yorkers were buried on Hart Island. Despite popular assumptions, a very large majority of those buried on Hart Island are identified and most have an identified next of kin. Frequently, a person's next of kin opts for a city burial because the decedent lacked the resources to afford a private burial, which can easily cost thousands of dollars. Cost should not be the only factor when determining a person's final resting place. In fact, there are resources available that can assist with private burial costs, yet they may be inaccessible or may be unknown. In the event that a city burial is the best option for an individual, their loved one should not feel shamed or discouraged from visiting the island. So after 150 years, it is time to re-examine and improve Hart Island and our city's public burial process. We should be mindful that this issue impacts every single one of us. Death is universal, and we should all be afforded the opportunity to be buried and we should be able to bury our loved ones in a dignified fashion, whatever our financial status may be. Those who do not have the resources or support to access a private burial deserve, deserve a more accessible and appropriate final resting place. We must engage all stakeholders. City agencies, thank you for being here today. The advocates who have done an incredible job and our communities across the city to work together to ensure that we are meaningfully assisting those who lack the resources to afford a private burial and to make sure they are fully informed and supported in their decision making. We must ensure that Heart Island itself fulfills its potential as a peaceful and pleasant final resting place. We must make sure that those who wish to pay their respects at Heart Island do not face unnecessary barriers. And we must make sure our city's public burial process is sustainable and equitable. I want to thank you all for attending today's hearing, and I look forward to having a robust discussion. Before I turn it over to my colleagues and the chairs who are co-chairing this hearing today, I'd like to quickly run through a site that the City Council created to highlight some heart information uh, data. So I'm just going to quickly bring folks uh, through this. So if you take a look uh, on the screen here, uh, the site highlights key statistics and information regarding Heart Island and the city burial process. You see right there the total, if you scroll back up, you see the total buried, a million people, and buried in 2018, uh, 1,213 people. First, we provide an overview of Heart Island with some background information, and this is on the City Council's website. Then we provide information and visual, visualizations of the impact of the AIDS epidemic on our city, as well as the public burial process. 
During the late 1980s and early 1990s, the number of individuals buried in Heart Island each year increased markedly, as shown by this chart, uh, which was created by our amazing data and analytics team here at the City Council. So you can see uh, how it went up during the height of the AIDS epidemic. The first people identified as AIDS victims were buried in Heart Island in 1985, and their remains were treated with an unnecessary level of caution due to the public's lack of knowledge of AIDS. They were buried in an isolated area away from the remains of other individuals in deep graves under several feet of dirt instead of the typical three feet. We also analyzed the average age at the time of death of children and adults buried at Heart Island. On average, people on Heart Island die at a younger age than the general population. We can see the average age of death decreasing during the 1980s and early 1990s, corresponding with the AIDS epidemic, which we just showed and I mentioned, and then increasing markedly thereafter. Next, we developed an interactive map showing where in the city individuals who are buried in Heart Island, uh, where they were from, where they lived. This map distinguishes uh, whether a person died at a public hospital, a voluntary hospital, a nursing facility, or a residential or other facility. The map illustrates how the distribution of locations and other types of locations of where individuals buried at Heart Island died, how it changes over time. If you, if you want to just, uh, whoever is doing an amazing job here. Oh, thank you, Julia. You're doing, thank you so much for this. If you want to just go back to the, yeah, to, and show, maybe click through and show how it changes on the, So you see sort of how it's become more disparate over time of where people um, were died uh, that end up on Heart Island. Uh, the page ends by, uh, the website ends by including general information about the burial process, how one can visit Heart Island, and the legislation that we are hearing here today. Uh, the page is open to the public and it is available on the council's data website. I welcome others to take a look and to uh, share. And uh, are we turning it over to, back over to the chairs? Yes, so I wanna turn, thank you very much, I wanna turn it back over uh, to our health committee chair, uh, Mark Levine, uh, to make remarks. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, for that phenomenal opening statement, the best encapsulation of this issue I've ever heard. And thank you for allocating the resources to help the public understand this through the new website. It's really incredibly impactful. We have been joined by a few additional council members, including council member Joe Borelli, council member Diana Ayala, council member Fernando Cabrera. And uh, I am thrilled that we are not just discussing this issue today. We are considering four very important pieces of legislation that aim to ensure dignity, respect, and ease of visitation to the individuals buried at Heart Island. The bills are Introduction 906, sponsored by Councilmember Rodriguez, in relation to a transfer of jurisdiction over Heart Island from the Department of Corrections to the Department of Parks and Recreation. Introduction 909, also sponsored by Councilmember Rodriguez, in relation to ferry service to Heart Island. Introduction 1580, sponsored by Councilmember Rose, in relation to the creation of a task force on public burial and related issues, and introduction 1559, sponsored by Councilmember Ayala, in relation to the establishment of an office to provide support to those in need of burial assistance. This, this hearing seeks to bring focus and resources to an issue that has too long been overlooked or put aside. The council has actually held several hearings on Heart Island over the past decade, and I want to acknowledge the leadership of former council member Elizabeth Crowley, who championed this issue in the past term. And I especially want to acknowledge the brilliant and determined activism of Melinda Hunt, who has almost single-handedly dragged this issue into the public spotlight and has built the first publicly accessible database of burials there that has been 
a life-changing resource for families who have been searching for the location of loved ones that in some cases they didn't even know were buried on Heart Island, and I look forward to hearing from Melinda later in this hearing. We have thankfully made important progress on Heart Island in recent years, thanks uh, to the leadership at the Department of Corrections, which as the speaker mentioned, we know cares about providing dignity on the island. Um, and that has resulted in uh, the first regularly scheduled public visitation on the island, though limited, and it has resulted in greater information on burials now available to the public. But as the speaker mentioned, the status quo remains unacceptable. And in my opinion, it really is heartbreaking. Health equity doesn't just mean access to medical care in life. It must mean dignity at end of life at well. It's a dignity that we too often deny to New Yorkers who live on the margins. That's been true on Heart Island for 150 years, where those who die poor or homeless or shunned because they died of AIDS or other infectious diseases or people who simply died isolated and alone are sent to an island where they are too often, again, neglected and forgotten in death. Still today, in 2019, we are burying on average 1,200 New Yorkers every year on an island which is off limits to the public and where even families visiting loved ones buried there do so under highly constrained conditions, under watch by armed correction officers. And we simply cannot fix this unless we end the Dickensian practice of using Rikers Island inmates to conduct burials on Hart Island. Transferring care for the island to the Parks Department opens up a world of possibilities to repair the natural environment of the island, consistent with the cutting edge practices of the green burial movement, to preserve those historic structures which can be saved on the island, and most importantly, to remove the security restrictions which have for too long blocked families and the public from a chance to freely visit this extraordinary place. I look forward to a robust discussion on these topics. I want to again thank the speaker for his passion and his for, for his determination to take on this issue. And I very much look forward to hearing from the administration as well. I now want to pass it off to the chair of the Transportation Committee and sponsor of two of our bills today, Chair Idanis Rodriguez. And Councilman Daniel Rodriguez, the Chair of the Committee of Transportation. Uh, again, thank you, Speaker Johnson, for your leadership, not only on this bill, but many other bills important to the whole city of New York. I would also like to thank Melinda Hunt for, from the Hart Island Project for being here with us today. You have played an important role, and together with you, you have mothers sitting there that they already are proud of the story mother that they lost their loved one, that it took them a year to reconnect, to find out where their loved one were buried. And it took them so many time, to so much effort for them to be able to go back to the area where the child was buried. So our solidarity and thank you because we have chose also uh, to fight for more than one million, not only New Yorkers, but visitors and many other who re been reclaiming the right to give the dignity and respect to individuals buried in that island. The support, uh, Melinda and, and our council member and chair, uh, Levinse, uh, uh, many other elected officials also in the previous council and advocate have been very important. With more than one million people, as, a, as, as it has been said, laid to rest in Hart Island, it is a place that is revered by many New Yorkers. As such, those that visit Hart Island to pay their respect to family members or friends should feel welcome and respect. They should not be guarded by anyone. Uh, they should be very able to walk free in that area. Mass burials began in the 1870s with its original intention to be that of a burial ground for strangers that died during the Civil War a stranger were considered people who were either black, immigrants, or the poor, 
who died in the city slums. While I commend the work that the Department of Correction does to maintain and operate Heart Island on a daily basis, I have long been concerned with the process and the transportation hurdles that visitors have to go through to get there and how they feel while they are in that area. In an effort to open Hard Island to the public and give the dignity, dignity and respect to the men and women who are buried there, I have introduced two pieces of legislation. The first bill is Intro 906, which will transfer the jurisdiction and control of Hard Island from the Departments of Corrections to the Departments of Park and Recreation. This transfer will allow Hart Island to be considered a publicly accessible park land that can be visited regularly and without having to make any long-term reservations or being escorted by a correctional officers and all the respect to the correctional officers. I'm also interested in seeing how some of the space can be reclaimed either for the museum to embrace all the history that Hart Island offers, or a historical landmark for people of New York to learn, New York and visitor to learn more about the history of New York City. The second bill is proposed intro 99-A. This bill will require DOT or another agency designated by the mayor to develop a transportation plan for the public to travel to travel to the island, including ferry service. In developing this plan, the agency will also have to consider factors such as changing conditions and the future use of Hart Island. Finally, the designated agency will have to submit a report to the council and the mayor on their plan within one year of the bill's effective date and to post the report on the website. It is my hope that this transportation plan will eventually make Hart Island more accessible to the public and make it easier for New Yorkers to pay their respect to their loved ones and to allow visitors to walk free on the island so they can learn about its history. A history that tells the countless stories of New, York, New York's immigrants, the poor, the homeless, the marginalized, and the rejected. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for your leadership on this issue. I look forward to working with you and the mayor on this bill to help improve accessibility and the overall condition of Hard Island. Hoy le estamos dando respeto a los inmigrantes y a muchos neoyorquinos que han sido enterrados en el cementerio público más grande de la nación, donde hay más de un millón de cuerpos enterrados por más de 100 años. La mayoría son inmigrantes y personas pobres. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And now we'll cue the Acting Chair of Parks Committee, Andy Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair Levine. Good morning. Uh, I'm Andy Cohen, and I will be the Acting Chair of the Parks Committee uh, for this hearing. Uh, I want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson, Council Member Chair Levine, uh, Chair Rodriguez for convening this joint hearing. I will say, as uh, the other chairs gave their openings, I've been cutting away things that I don't want to uh, repeat. Uh, but I do think that uh, a lot of this has been covered thoroughly. There are just a few quick points I do want to make. Um, I do believe that this is the second hearing since I've been here that we've had on, on Hart Island. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, because of the, <clears throat> the advocacy of uh, several groups, including the Hart Island Project, uh, the Potter's Field Campaign, a picture of the homeless, and the interfaith friends of Potter's Field, uh, access to Hart Island has changed significantly and improved uh, uh, and I think that we should acknowledge that uh, DOC initially only permitted visitors by appointment and only if they were related to a person buried on the island. These visits were limited to a gazebo area, uh, which is far from the grave sites and does not provide a view of the graves. DOC then lifted the, its requirements that visitors be related to a person buried in Potter's Field and instituted a regular ferry service. Additionally, family members of the deceased may visit the grave areas of family uh, members with DOC escorts. Uh, visits must be scheduled in advance, but may be done through the internet or the phone. Uh, despite this improvement, I think that we can do better, and having the Parks Department, which has greater expertise in managing city land, take control over the island would be a step forward in improving public access and creating a more respectable environment for those buried there. 
Um, proposed intro 906A uh, would explore that possibility and transfer jurisdiction uh, from DOC to the Parks Department. While uh, the Parks Department has specific expertise in managing active cemetery, doesn't had specific, does, not, does have the ex expertise to help develop parts of the island into an acceptable open space, being that it is already responsible for about 13 islands in the New York waterways. I look forward to examining the ways the Parks Department, DOC, the Medical Examiner, and DOC can, and HRA can all work together to plan and implement long-term strategies to o open Heart Island and improve the city's public burial process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And now I'd like to cue one of the sponsors of the bills in our package today, Councilmember Diane Ayala. Good morning. I'm really excited to be here today. Finally, this has been something that has been weighing heavily on my heart for many, many, many years. Um, it isn't, you know, too uh, unusual for individuals living in my district to appeal to my office um, or to members of the community for assistance when, you know, one of their loved ones passes away with, you know, uninsured and without the, the savings um, required for a proper funeral or burial. Um, so I'm here today to talk about intro 1559, which would establish the Office of Burial Assistance with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. As we know, burial costs are expensive. Families without the means to pay often have to scramble to borrow thousands of dollars to pay for a funeral, all while grieving their loved ones. It's common for families to accrue debt to resort to burying their relatives hours away from home, which impact how often they can visit the grave. Within the last year, several families have approached my office seeking assistance for funeral costs, and I was limited in my ability to help them. Thankfully, this bill will create an office that will be incredibly helpful for families dealing with a loss, especially those that are in need of burial allowance and or wish to consider a public burial. Prior to becoming a council member, I worked for the council for 12 years, and I spent much of that time doing, what, doing constituent services. Had this office existed then, my colleagues and I would have been able to steer dozens of families in the right direction. It is my hope that the department will express support for this bill and will work with, the office, with my office to successfully establish it in the nearby future. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ayala. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Keith Powers, as well as Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer, and I would like to cue uh, another sponsor of a bill in our package today, Councilmember Debbie Rose, for some remarks. Thank you, Chair, um, and good morning. Uh, I first want to thank the speaker for advancing this package of bills, which humanizes uh, many New Yorkers that are, are often forgotten and treated with less than the same level of respect as others. And I want to thank Chair Levine and uh, Chair Rodriguez for convening this hearing on this very important package of bills um, for a group of people who have been voiceless. I'm here to speak about Intro 1580, which will create a public burial task force to review the laws, rules, regulations, policies, and procedures related to public burial and to consider and make recommendations regarding changes to such laws, rules, regulations, policies, and procedures. An estimated one million people are buried at Hart Island, most of whom remain nameless to us, but to someone else they were a child, a parent, or maybe even just a friend. A mother who gives her consent to a city burial for infancy loss is often unaware that her child will end up among other unidentified loved ones at a burial site that is not easily accessible. To me, this is sad and deeply troubling and not in keeping with our values as a city. In fact, I allocate discretionary funds every year to ensure that burial arrangements are made for all Staten Islanders with dignity and respect. There are not, if you noticed on that map, there are very few Staten Islanders buried at Hart Island. It is important to me that everyone be buried in an accurately recorded space that can be found and visited. The task force created by Intro 1580 will issue a report to the mayor with recommendations for improving the process for identifying loved ones finding and contacting the next of kin, support and communication for next of kin that are considering a public burial or burial assistance programs and more. My hope is that this task force will identify new ways for the city 
to ensure that those identified for public burial are given a proper and dignified burial. I would like to thank Emily Balkin um, for her support on this bill and all who worked on this. And I look forward to hearing the testimony today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. And now I'd like to ask our committee council, Sara List, to administer the affirmation for the administration. And if everyone from the administration who plans to either testify or answer questions could please raise their right hand. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You can proceed. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Speaker Johnson, uh, Chair Levine, Chair Rod uh, Rodriguez, uh, Acting Chair Cohen, and the other uh, uh, committee members and council members. Uh, my name is Matt Drury. I'm the Director of Government Relations for NYC Parks, and I'm joined here today by several uh, of my agency, uh, other agency colleagues. Uh, NYC Parks is the steward of 14% of New York City's land mass, and we're the manager of nearly 4,500 individual properties, ranging from parks and playgrounds to community gardens and green streets. <clears throat> As uh, our colleagues from NYC Human Resources Administration will outline in more detail shortly, uh, after 150 years of uh, using Hart Island as the city's public burial ground, primarily overseen and managed by NYC Department of Correction, the city is committed to finding another model uh, for providing these services and for another location for these uh, future burials to occur. Uh, concurrent to these efforts, the city will develop a plan to facilitate continued public access to Hart Island as friends and family will continue uh, to visit the grave sites of those buried on the island even as new burials cease. Uh, once the city, led by HRA, has established and operationalized a process for burials to occur off-island, facilitating the end of new burials uh, on the island, uh, jurisdiction of Hart Island, uh, we support a transfer to NYC Parks. Uh, this role would be consistent with the agency's existing responsibilities, as NYC Parks already has jurisdiction over a small number of historic cemeteries. Uh, under our jurisdiction, we expect that public access to Hart Island uh, will resemble uh, the access currently provided by DOC with, 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 uh, with some key differences. Uh, visiting opportunities will continue, uh, certainly at a similar frequency to what's currently offered today, uh, facilitated uh, via ferry service, which will continue to be provided by the Department of Transportation. Uh, NYC Parks will provide uh, general maintenance on the island, uh, perform upkeep uh, on the grave sites, and facilitate uh, visitor services for family and friends of those buried on the island, uh, as well as visits uh, by the general public. Uh, in advance of this jurisdictional transfer, uh, operational procedures will need to be clarified. A uh, great many questions uh, will need to be answered. So the agency uh, will be working closely with the mayor's office and other agencies to fully examine all uh, the uh, operational, logistical, budgetary implications uh, involved with overseeing the site. Uh, in the meantime, DOC will continue to manage burials and uh, public visitation to Hart Island uh, until these new processes can be established. Uh, given all the complexities that need to be discussed and examined, it's difficult at this time to forecast a precise timeline for the transition or to identify the specific operational practices that will be put into place. But uh, we will certainly keep the council fully updated as we continue to examine and discuss the importance of dignified public burial proceedings and the uh, broader future of Hart Island. Uh, as you will hear from our fellow agencies, this administration is committed to preserving the dignity of those resting in our public burial grounds and to ensuring a meaningful visit experience for all visitors to those sites. Uh, thanks for allowing uh, me to testify before you today and for your broader support for uh, NYC Parks and our uh, ongoing efforts. I'll now defer to my colleagues at Human uh, Resources Administration to provide you with additional background about this important topic. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chairs Levine, uh, Rodriguez, and Acting Chair Cohen, and members of the committees for the opportunity to testify today regarding Hart Island. My name is Nicole Doniger-Strom, and I am HRA's Chief of Staff. The New York City Human Resource Administration and Department of Social Services is the nation's largest social service agency. Each year, we assist more than 3 million New Yorkers through the administration of 12 public assistance programs, including burial assistance. Every day in all five boroughs, HRA provides essential programs and supports to low-income New Yorkers. We work to ensure that our services and benefits provide low-income New Yorkers the assistance they need through a, variety, a wide range of supports, including cash assistance and employment services, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, Medicaid, eviction prevention, and rental assistance. 
In administering these programs, HRA is at the forefront of this administration's efforts to address poverty and address homelessness. Pursuant to the New York State Social Service Law and established eligibility criteria, HRA provides financial assistance to individuals to help meet funeral expenses. These funds are made available when an indigent resident of New York City dies who may have been a recip recipient of supplemental security income or cash assistance or leaves no funds to cover their burial expenses and there are no legally responsible relatives able to pay such expenses. To access this assistance, the individual making the funeral arrangements can call 311 or find the application on our website. This assistance is critical to many New Yorkers who lack adequate funds uh, for their loved ones. As such, we are in the process of implementing changes to ensure grieving New Yorkers can easily access this assistance. For example, one barrier was overly burdensome documentation requirements causing applications for burial assistance to be denied. To address this, we will soon be <clears throat> streamlining our application process to reduce the documentation needed and clarify the instances when further documentation would be required. As we look to the future, HRA will continue to play a significant role in burial assistance in New York City. We are authorized by the state of New York to ensure that the city of New York provides for the burial of the indigent dead. The first step will be releasing a request for information this fall to collect information about the market for public cemetery corporations. Given the current state of unknowns, we anticipate this burial assistance procurement process to take up to several years with opportunity for input from this body and the public. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to the committee's questions. Are there any other administration statements? Okay. Uh, we'll pass it off to the speaker for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Levine. I want to thank you uh, all for being here today for that testimony. Matt, it's always good to see you. Thanks for uh, your partnership. Um, so what I, what I heard was support for uh, transferring jurisdiction from the Department of Corrections to the Department of Parks, which we're happy about. But what um, sounded a little uh, strange, at least to me, and um, what I uh, don't see, I think, as the vision from the council, as you can see from the legislation that's being heard today, is I hear sort of a top-down approach. I hear an approach where the Parks Department and uh, uh, the other agencies are going to come up with some guidelines on an undetermined timeline with an RFEI to get to a place at some point where eventually more information will eventually be shared with the city council and with the public. And what the uh, legislation calls for is a bottom-up approach. It calls for a task force. It doesn't call for the city agencies that have been involved in telling the city council and the public the way it's going to work. It calls on a collaborative approach. So there seems to be a bit of a delta that exists between our vision of what we think it should look like and what you all think it should look like. And I'd love to understand uh, why that is the posture the administration is taking on this issue. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. This administration is committed to finding a path forward that is both dignified um, and equitable for all New Yorkers. We've begun the research process to understand what a future landscape of indigent burials could look like, and it's a complicated landscape, which is why our RFI seeks to have input from this body and from stakeholders to better understand what a future program could look like. Do you support the task force bill? We support having input from um, the council members and stakeholders. We believe an RFI um, is a path forward on this, but we support the intent of the task force. Okay. Uh, are you open to the possibility of keeping public burials on Hot Island? Our plan is not to have public burials on Hot Island. Our plan is to find a, a path forward to make it more uh, accessible for New Yorkers. Um, as the RFI, we hope, will be instructive in this, and um, we'll have to see what comes back from that. And what is, what is your ideal vision of Hart Island? Actually, from the Parks Department's perspective, what is the ideal vision five years from now? What should happen if someone wants to visit a Hart Island? What should it look like? 
What should the hours of operation be? What should access look like? What is that ultimate vision? Uh, I think our priority, this, the administration's priority here, and I'll paraphrase your opening statement, is making sure that Heart Island is a safe, pleasant, and peaceful place for, for loved ones and families of those buried on the island to, to enjoy that experience uh, and be able, uh, the operational details in terms of visitation, like there's a lot of details that still need to be examined and worked out. So, you know, unfortunately we're not prepared to discuss that today. A lot of that is going to be contingent on, you know, continuing examinations of the site conditions of the island, other operational models. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, so today is a bit premature to sort of, you know, set, uh, set those things uh, in stone, but, you know, uh, what we are committed to, again, is sort of preserving, you know, sort of the dignity of those buried there and making sure that it's a meaningful experience for those who visit. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, introduction 906 by uh, Chair Rodriguez calls for uh, parks to gain jurisdiction after 180 days after this becomes law. Do you agree with that timeline? Uh, we support the transfer jurisdiction for Hart Island after uh, the city, led by HRA, has been able to sort of establish and operationalize a process uh, for burials to occur off island, which will, you know, then facilitate the end of active burials on Hart Island. Uh, it's hard to envision that being possible in 180 days, technically speaking, but we want to work with the council and the bill sponsors to kind of uh, discuss that further. I mean, it sounds to me, given the testimony uh, that we just heard that said from uh, HRA that the first step will be releasing a request for information this fall to collect information about the market for public cere uh, cemetery corporations Given the current state of unknowns, we anticipate this burial assistance procurement process to take up to several years with the opportunity for input from this body, from the city council, and from the public. I mean, that, that, that's not the intention of these bills, is to kick the can down the road for three years. The, the public has waited far too long to gain access in a responsible and reasonable way to Hart Island, and several years uh, at least from my, I mean, these are not my bills, but at least from my perspective, is not a good enough timeline uh, given uh, what we've seen happen uh, for loved ones who have not been able to gain access. And <clears throat> several years, the mayor won't be mayor, and there'll be a new administration. So it is, again, kicking the can down the road. This needs to be done in an expedited manner. Uh, I visited Hart Island late last year, and the wonderful staff here at the council had been in touch with the legislative staff on the other side of City Hall and the different agencies here. And while I'm grateful that we are to the place of agreeing that jurisdictions should no longer be the Department of Corrections and be transferred to the Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, this has been months and months and months of conversations. This has been years and years and years of criticism. This has been the media telling the story, the bad stories of what's happened on Hart Island. So to give an undetermined timeline uh, and to not have a more specific vision for what Hart Island should look like, I'm not sure is the best preparation uh, or presentation for today's hearing. So we expect more detailed answers moving forward, and again, we expect not a top-down approach, but a bottom-up approach that uh, talks to the public and engages stakeholders in a way that is going to, I think, finally write something that um, has not been handled in the most correct way uh, uh, currently or for the last many years. So I I'd love to sort of, um, I just, I mean, it's not really a question, it's a statement. I mean, we, it's not, the testimony that I heard today is not good enough. Uh, we have a different vision and a different timeline and a different set of expectations to get this right. And the undetermined timeline, I don't think is good enough uh, for us. Uh, if there's anything you want to say to that? I think we'd only signal that this is a, a really significant change in you know 150 years of city practice. So obviously, we want to make sure that the approach forward is thoughtful, well considered. Obviously, as from parks, you know, in terms of the end result being you know the change in jurisdiction for Hart Island, but also the various other impacts that will be made for public burials. Uh, this is a pretty massive and complicated undertaking with a lot of different, very technical and complicated uh, aspects to it. So the city is just going to do its best to make sure that this is fully examined and thought out. So we respect the. Uh, 
uh, the, the, uh, the urgency with which uh, advocates and the council uh, view this matter, and we share that, that urgency, uh, but we also want to make sure that we're proceeding forward thoughtfully and carefully. So what, what can we do in the meantime to improve Hard Island's maintenance? What is the plan to improve the maintenance in the, in the, in the intervening time? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your question. Um, at this time, the department um, proudly maintains Hard Island to the best of their ability and will be undertaking this summer, beginning the shoreline restoration project to ensure that the um, areas of the island, the north, west, and east shorelines that were damaged by Hurricane Sandy are restored and repaired to structural integrity. And moving forward, um, we'll continue to do our groundskeeping and bring in um, Beautification, when we can, we have a horticultural program for incarcerated individuals that once the weather um, is um, pleasant enough to bring them up, they will be going up to do a beautification project on the island. And we certainly uh, welcome any conversations with the council uh, and advocates in terms of further beautification ideas. Can parks help as needed, given parks has expertise in maintaining trees and horticulture and that's what Parks does in the intervening time. Can Parks be working with DOZ and sending personnel to help out on Hard Island? Uh, we actually, uh, Parks actually has worked directly with DOC in the past uh, regarding especially uh, helping out with some targeted projects uh, for some of the uh, natural areas of the island. Uh, we're happy to continue providing that expertise and, and assistance uh, in terms of horticultural. Uh, we, we engaged in a project uh, a couple years ago to, to address an invasive species that had emerged on the island uh, known as the mile a minute. Uh, vine, which can be, you know, which can be really damaging to, to uh, existing uh, species of, of uh, plantings and whatnot, and we were able to work closely with, with DOC in managing that through a really creative approach involving uh, little weevil, uh, weevils that are about the size of an ice cream sprinkle, but, uh, but that and, and with other sort of, uh, in terms of the beautification of the island, we're happy to continue working with DOC on, on uh, projects of that nature. So I still don't understand. It, when people visit Hart Island, I mean, it didn't uh, pertain to me or some of the staff when we requested an official visit. We were escorted by DOC, who uh, were total professionals and did a great job in showing us the island. But I still don't understand how come loved ones have to stand at a gazebo uh, just a few dozen yards from the ferry landing? How come there isn't greater access to the actual public burial sites currently. Why is that decision made? So the, thank you for the question. The department operates two different types of visitation services. So one is the monthly gazebo visits, which are for public visitations. And then secondly are the monthly family gravesite visits, where family members can register to sign up to visit a specific plot location and spend time um, at that area to um, have, reflect with their thoughts and have a moment with their, their loved one um, in a private space. Family members, not friends. There, it's an authorized um, list, so I believe at times we do accommodate if a family member requests friends to visit. What if you're someone who had a partner die of AIDS? who was not at that moment in time considered a family member, or the family didn't accept that you were the partner of the person that died of AIDS. What happens in that instance? The department takes all the requests very seriously and would, would work with the individuals making the requested visit to accommodate as best as we can. That's, that's not a, I say with respect, I mean, that's not a, an adequate answer. This shows the madness of the current setup. This shows the insanity that when you have We are taking um, each request on a case-by-case -case basis, and I was just notified that recently we had an out-of-country visit for um, a friend of someone interred in Hart Island that had no family members in the United States. So we certainly take these requests seriously and try to accommodate as much as we can. I still think the current setup and given the undetermined timeline does not leave me with confidence that anytime soon, we're gonna have a process that involves 
real comfort and dignity and accessibility, not just for family members, but for uh, other loved ones, other friends uh, who want to visit an individual who is buried on Hart Island. So uh, again, I mean, I think that the good part of this hearing is that there is a conceptual agreement on the jurisdictional transfer. But there are many, 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 many other in unanswered questions that I wish were being answered as part of uh, the testimony today. And there needs to be a plan, an immediate plan, on how we are going to give greater accessibility and comfort to loved ones and family members in the intervening time between their jurisdictional transfer, and even before the bill passes, the plan should, the plan should actually uh, be out there, and uh, uh, waiting three years on a potential RFEI for a public cemetery corporation is not a good enough timeline for me. So I still think there's a lot of work to do. I'm glad we're having this hearing today to have this conversation. We look forward to continuing to engage with you. And I turn this back to Chair Levine. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Donovan Richards, as well as uh, Councilmember Eric Ulrich. And uh, I, I want to echo his sentiment that because DOC has jurisdiction, the entire island is a secure facility. And therefore, you have a million people buried without open access. And that is really the root of the profound, profound injustice here. This should be an open access public site. There should not be a government agency screening people to determine whether they are close enough as kin or friendship or intimate partners. And we wouldn't have to even grapple with that if this weren't a secure facility because of DOT, DOC jurisdiction, which is at the root of our bills today. I just want, I want to clarify one thing about the timeline you're proposing. Um, you've referred multiple times to moving off the island as a long-term plan for public burial. Um, that could be a decade-long process, as the speaker mentioned. It takes a long time for the city to do anything, unfortunately, and something uh, that requires locating another site and another community with all the concerns that that potentially uh, ar that would arise. Um, that could be an epic, epic process. Um, but there's so much we could do immediately on the island, um, including transferring the burial function on the island to an entity other than DOC. Could be another city agency. It could be an independent nonprofit with expertise in this. Um, is, is your plan to move as quickly as possible on island to transfer the burial function? Or is your plan to wait until another location has been established? Uh, specific to parks, you know, uh, we as an agency, you know, the active burials, uh, we believe, uh, is, falls well outside of our sort of purview and expertise. So I think we are going to work closely with our, our city agencies and HRA uh, as they release uh, the RFI, as we understand the landscape better uh, in terms of transitioning away from active burials on the island. But we're not asking the Parks Department to create a burial unit. You manage Prospect Park, there's a cemetery in Prospect Park, you don't do the burials there. The French Society does the burials. You manage the landscape. There's a perfect setup. You have an independent, nonprofit entity entity doing the burials. Parks manage the landscape. Why couldn't we do that immediately on Hart Island? Uh, the, and I'll maybe refer a little bit to how the RFI that's being released is going to help inform some of the options that are before us, both short, medium, and long term. Yeah, I believe so, that's certainly the, the... The RFI will, will be for transitioning burial on Hart Island to another entity, or it is for the much longer process of finding a new site? Uh, I'll let my colleague make sure I, I don't mischaracterize, but I believe it's to assess, ass essentially assess the process of public burials as it exists, you know, writ large, which currently takes place on Hart, Hart Island. So uh, in terms of whether that can be a short-term transition to another entity and then longer term, uh, you know, transition to another location. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know if you want to clarify further there, but I, I believe it's to examine sort of the full scope of, of you know, the public burial process. That's absolutely right. The, and our intention is not for this to be 10 years. Our intention is to move swiftly to find a sh good path forward, um, one that is dignified. Um, the RFI is, an, is a really important step. 
because we ha we've been doing this this way for, as you all mentioned, over 150 years. It is a big shift in city policy, and we want to make sure that we do it right. We want to make sure that people have access. This is a big step forward, yes. This entire hearing is a big step forward, and we're not facing the, the blanket opposition from the administration that we faced last time. But I, I just want to clarify this question. The RFI will be for transitioning burial functions on Hart Island, which we can do quickly, or is it for finding a new location that will take many years? The current plan is for the RFI to find a new location. Okay, that's not acceptable. We can do so much on the island beginning today, and until we get DOC out of the burial business, <clears throat> everything is gonna be constrained. Visitation's constrained, uh, public access is constrained, restoration work is constrained. We have to get another entity bearing there. It could be another city agency, it could be HRA, it could be an independent entity. Uh, there are no shortage of nonprofits which do burial all over the city that could move in very, very quickly, uh, perhaps could even do it more cheaply than what we're paying for DOC. Uh, this, this, this needs to be the plan. And uh, as the speaker mentioned, there's a lot we can do on the island independent of burial. We have dozens of historic structures which are cr crumbling, which are a danger to the public. Some of them probably need to be demolished and removed. Some of them, I hope, could be restored as, uh, as a way to preserve the history of this island, which was used as a quarantine facility, which was used as a, 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 a drug treatment facility, which was used as a home for troubled youth. That history could be preserved and taught. <clears throat> there are nuclear missile silos on the island from the Cold War uh, that are exposed and could be preserved as a teaching <clears throat> tool or perhaps need to be removed. There's a monument to world peace on the island. Um, the natural environment is, is in a state of utter neglect. The island was breached in Sandy. Um, since then, there has, been, there has been multiple cases of disinterment of human remains with body parts washing up uh, in parts of the Bronx and City Island. Uh, that is still happening um, when there's a heavy rain or storms. Uh, I mean, the, the, the ultimate desecration of, of the, the, the memory and dignity of the people who are buried there. And Hurricane Sandy was years ago. The federal money was allocated years ago. And uh, I did hear reference to that work starting. Um, but that should have been started a long time ago. That work should be done immediately just to shore up the, the, the water's edge to prevent further inundation and disinterment. Mm -hmm. The natural environment has been completely uh, obliterated over, over the last uh, century and a half. It's invasive species have taken over everywhere. Uh, there is so much work that could be done immediately on the island, which whatever the long-term plan is going to be the final resting place of one million human beings, one million New Yorkers. No RFI is gonna change that. So we need to have open, dignified access for anyone who cares about a human being who's buried there, for anyone who wants to understand this iconic place, the history, the natural environment, all that has to happen today. We cannot wait to find another burial ground. Uh, we cannot wait 10 years or more for that. Um, can you, can you talk again about the immediate plans for shoreline restoration, the timeline, for natural restoration, uh, for the physical structures there which are crumbling and which are dangerous, and for all that we can do now to improve this facility for everybody? Sure, thank you, Chair, for the question. So it took several years to iron out the details to receive the FEMA funding and develop the plan for the shoreline restoration. The design began in 2016 and concluded in 2018. We went through the design build procurement methods. So once we had the design, we went to construction bid. Construction bid has concluded, contract's been registered, the kickoff meeting has occurred, and we plan to begin construction this, uh, within the next several months. That uh, construction project will take up to two years to be completed. Um, as a part of this process, we also retained a archeological consultant that provides us quarterly reports related to the conditions of the damaged shoreline areas with um, considerable, focus, considerable focus, excuse me, 
on any exposed remains. And then those exposed remains are collected and held um, for proper reburial when the shoreline has been restored. So anything that has already been exposed won't get further disruption due to the project. So we are certainly taking all those items into consideration as we move forward with the project and we take the issue very seriously. The fact that almost seven years after Hurricane Sandy, the restoration work has not begun is exhibit A of why we're skeptical that you would quickly find a new location for burial, a far more complicated mm -hmm. and politically fraught process. Uh, again, seven years just to restore the store line. We're talking about a massive undertaking to relocate it. Um, and I, I am curious about why you take it as a given that we do need to relocate the burial site there. So the, the island only has capacity for so much going forward. Additionally, there are portions of the, we're trying to utilize as much of the land as possible. Um, the land that isn't suitable for burial, we cannot utilize. So at some point, the island will run out of capacity for, for future burials. When will that happen? We anticipate that would be within perhaps the next eight to 10 years. That gives us at best then eight to 10 years to fix this in place. Uh, I would like it offline to review with you how you came to that calculation. A, only a small portion of the surface area of the island is currently uh, filled up by burial sites and that's one million bodies. We're adding about 1,200 a year. Um, there are big parts of the island that are taken up by structures and that could easily be removed and probably will be removed. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's not entirely clear to me how you came to such a short-term calculation, uh, but, but we, we can perhaps talk about that offline. Um, there are currently, uh, is, is there a DOC uh, person at, at the table? Yeah. Thank, thank you, uh, forgive me, sorry. Um, the inmates who are burying at, on the island, um, could you explain what they're paid? whether that work is voluntary, whether they get any kind of counseling services, because I can imagine it's emotionally very difficult to spend your days doing this work. Uh, could you explain a little bit about the experience of the inmates, uh, whether this is voluntary, uh, and their perspective on this? Uh, sure, so, so the inmates that, the incarcerated individuals that are, alloc that are assigned to the work detail are selected by what's called an inmate assignment office in, within the facility that they're, they're in custody, namely EMTC, which is the facility for city sentenced individuals. Um, they are given a screening process um, by their facility and then additionally by the captain that is assigned to the Hart Island um, uh, compound to ensure that the, the um, incarcerated individuals that are going to be working on the site understand what they'll be doing, um, are prepared for it, and are um, okay with um, being in a work environment like that. There are instances where it, it works out and, and the, the incarcerated individuals doing the assignment do it well, and other instances where yes, it may be too much for someone emotionally or psychologically to handle an assignment of that nature, and that you know the uh, captain at the island will notify that um, person's facility where they came from and then you know we'll, we'll look for we'll seek a replacement they are charged one, they are paid sorry one dollar per hour for their service we just want to make sure this is not a form of punishment for people that we're not unsensitive insensitive to the psychological burden that this would pose on somebody and it's all whenever you talk about people incarcerated on Rikers we always have to remind ourselves that the vast majority have not been convicted of anything they're awaiting trial, and so they needed to be re re treated appropriately. Of course. Um, excellent. Um, I did have a, a question for, for OCME, Commissioner, um, because the, the, the moment in which you are interacting with uh, family members or next of kin with someone, uh, uh, a deceased uh, individual, uh, there's a critical moment where the burial plans or cremation plans need to be established. Could you explain to us uh, how that process is carried out and how you can assure uh, that 
the wishes if, as they're understood of the deceased individual are uh, indeed adhered to? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the process whether uh, it, the decedent comes to us from our own death scene investigations or the decedent comes to us from a custodial care facility such as a hospital or a nursing home follows the same process which is two-pronged. We do identifications of the decedent and that's an intense investigation to uh, confirm identification and then we do outreach to, the, uh, to determine the next of kin. Um, when we do find the next of kin, we have, uh, we deal with families. It's part of our core purpose, of course, uh, to provide answers to families uh, with uh, scientific forensic uh, methodologies. And we work very sensitively with those families during their time of grief. Um, we, uh, once we're in the outreach process, if we have not found next of kin and we have uh, not identified, we then proceed to coordinating with the Department of Corrections for a burial at Hart Island. When we have located next of kin, uh, we uh, meet with them either in person or by telephone, however they prefer, and we discuss with them how they would like to proceed with final disposition. Uh, families may choose to have their own funeral um, arrangements made with a private uh, funeral director, or they may choose for, to use a city cemetery, which is at no cost to them. We explain this is a com communal burial site uh, that will, uh, there will be no cost to the family. We also explain how they can uh, arrange for site visits to visit their loved one, and we also make it known to them that at a later time, if they wish to disinter, to proceed with the private arrangement, that they have that option to do that, and we explain how that's done. I, I appreciate that, and appreciate your sensitivity on this. Uh, I just want to point out how many people end up on Heart Island for purely economic reasons, simply because they can't afford a private burial, which can cost ten or fifteen thousand dollars. Even private cremation is several thousand dollars, and um, this, this really has become a matter of economic justice uh, in which the poor are sent to a place where their loved ones will not have access, which is not, not maintained in, in, in a beautiful, respectful way, where their bones are likely to be disinterred if there's a heavy rain. And I think we should always remember who it is who's ending up buried on Heart Island. It's, uh, it's not the wealthy and privileged. It's people with no other options. And we do want to make sure that um, we offer every New Yorker in this moment of death the dignity to have their wishes adhered to um, and wherever their final resting place may be, that is somewhere that is respectful of them uh, and, and of their loved ones. And, and, and I know you understand that. Um, I'm going to pass it off to, to uh, Chair Rodriguez for questioning. Thank you. Mr. Oh, Chair, sorry. Uh, I just have one quick question. So I just want to revisit, what is currently the official visitation policy? I want to know what the official, what it says, not, I don't want to minimize an individual who came from out of the country and got uh, a permission slip or an authorized visit or whatever it's called. Well, I want to know what the exact policy is so that it's not a fluke that someone gets in, but what does it say so that friends and non-family members, partners, people that may need to visit, what is the current policy? And where is it posted? Where, where, where can the public find that current policy published? Our visitation policy, thank you, Speaker, for the question. Our visitation policy is on the Heart, our Heart Island website that DOC maintains. Um, but for the family visitations, um, visitors who have family members buried on Heart Island, Heart Island must register with the department 12 business days before I mean, the scheduled visit day. And each family member may be accompanied on their gravesite visit by guests of their choice um, with up to five individuals in each group. We schedule multiple groups um, twice a day. So there's a 9 a.m. ferry service out to the island for a set of groups and then a 12 p.m. on um, one Saturday per month for the family visits. And um, there's, a, there's only one ferry service per weekend one, one day of a weekend per month. 
So one Saturday a month, and the other times are during the week. That, well, the Thursdays is the gazebo visit. So one Thursday per month, there'll be the gazebo visit for public visitation, and then one Saturday per month, um, there'll be the family visitation with two uh, times of departure for the ferry, 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. I, I mean, I, 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 again, uh, I see, uh, I believe it's the captain uh, who's here who was really a wonderful, wonderful guide and just handled our, our I really want to give him credit. He really handled our visit in such a dignified, professional, thoughtful way. And so I'm really grateful for his leadership and service that he provides on Hard Island. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for how you treat the families and how you treated us during our visit. I really, really appreciate uh, everything that you've done. And so in no way is this directed towards him or towards the great DOC staff, but this is insane. This is crazy that a million people are buried on Hard Island, mostly poor and marginalized individuals, and there is one Saturday a month to visit. It is crazy. I mean, this, this needs to be changed immediately. This should be the administration, and it's not just on this administration, this predates this administration. This is such a profound injustice. People should leave here today. Is the Office of Legislative Affairs here from the mayor's office? Where are they? Okay, so people should leave here today and be embarrassed, embarrassed by this. This is, this is so undignified. We should immediately go back and with all the smart people at this table and inside of government say, what can we do to do something more dignified and in a more compassionate, empathetic, kind, thoughtful way for loved ones and friends have a sane, rational visitation policy, not 12 days in advance, if you register one Saturday a month, what can we do in the short term to make this better? That's what I expect the administration to do before we legislate this, before we pass a bill. I expect in 30 days a report back to the council on what are we doing to improve accessibility, what are we doing to improve the visiting, visitation policy. If the captain and his team need more money, the city should give them more money. In the, meantime, in the meantime, before it's transferred, to get more staffing, more time, that's what should be done. This is the right thing to do. And I'll just end with this. I think, again, there's a disagreement on, uh, on some of the very important specifics here. And I think you're gonna hear from some advocates today who believe that public burial should continue on Hart Island. They believe that there is a potential way to have more capacity uh, for public burial. Again, if we had a master plan and a vision for the island, uh, there are some green cemeteries across the country that people have been looking at that could be a model. This might be the largest green cemetery in the United States of America. Uh, and so, Again, we want it not to be a decision that is solely made by the administration, but given the history here, given the profound injustice that I believe has occurred here, the task force is an appropriate place to have these conversations in a thoughtful, fact-based manner on the most appropriate way to move forward, not a top-down approach, but a bottom-up approach that is collaborative, consultive, and compassionate in how we make these decisions moving forward. And I look forward to having a conversation about what we can, what we can immediately do before we legislate to figure out a plan on the visitation policy and on accessibility and what we do on planning for the future and what ideally Hard Island should look like. And with that, I uh, turn it over to uh, Chair Rodriguez, who has uh, been a real leader on this issue, and I know we're hearing two of his bills today. Thank you. So, thank you, Speaker, and the rest of the colleague. Look, the fact that Hard Island was open to the public as a result of a lawsuit show a lot the injustice in that place. Not the injustice carried by each of you, but we as a city. I feel that as someone being Catholic, 
that when I go back to the island of the Dominican Republic, I feel so guilty if I don't go and visit the site of my father being buried. It's the same experience to many of those family members that they have a loved one buried in that site. So I believe that a time when the mayor is going to the whole nation, presenting all the accomplishments, when he addressed how is the city doing in one of the largest public cemeteries, I hope that this is one of those areas where he can share with, with individuals that he interact in any other city that he's visiting that the city have an active plan to give the just and the dignity to the more than one million individuals buried in the island. So that's my first, and, and, and I can say that it's interesting and important, and I give credit for you to be open to say we're ready to work with you guys. But the question again is the timeline. I think that, I hope that you can go back to your team and the piece related to give the jurisdiction to park should happen immediately. Because a cemetery should not be guarded by any law enforcement. Law enforcement have all the job that they have to do. There's a lot of work that they have to do at Rikers Island. There's a lot of work that they have to do in all, in all the detention centers. And, and no one should be stopped by walking in the island not being free. Uh, and I think that, you know, the men and women are correctional. They do the job that they being described. They had to take the phone, the cell phone. They had, they cannot allow people to take photo because those are treated as a, as a, as a facility on the correctional. When there's not any risk, of anyone taking photo in, 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 in that area. Uh, I feel that even in those areas, like, you know, as we did the walk, I have been there twice, once by myself and the second one with the speaker. And you know, we took time for the speaker to be in communication with City Hall to be allowed to take a photo because he was not supposed, nor his staff, to take photo as we were walking in Hug Island. So, and again, it's about who was in charge and what are the direction that the guidance that they had to follow. So I think that something that should be done immediately should be allowed one some changing in that policy. People should not have to leave the cell phone before getting into the boat. People should not be stopped to take photo when they go there. When we talk about the members of the public are allowed to go to the Hard Island, we're talking about that when the boat got to Hard Island, like whatever, 300 feet, the members of the public are allowed to be in the chapel. That's what we call access of members of the public. It's not that the members of the public is allowed to walk to the, to the, to the south side of the island and see the area where people who died during the HIV, they've been buried there. It's about you cross by, you walk like a score by someone from correctional doing the job, and you're allowed to be in the chapel. That's all. And you know what is there also interesting for me being there? A lot of Latino names being there. It means a lot that the immigrants component in that place. So again, we will work with the rest of my colleagues here, with the speaker, hoping that we will continue conversation as fast as possible, to cut the time. This is important for us. But I think that the piece related on how often the public is allowed to go there should not wait for this bill. The piece related for members of the public to be allowed to carry on the cell phone, to take photo when they go there, it should not be wait for this bill. This is something that I hope, again, that we guys can work together. One of my questions is, when you look at the numbers of people being buried last year, what percentage of those people were buried in Hart Island? One, because they didn't have money to pay to be buried in another cemetery. Uh, 
Go ahead. <laughs> Um, I'll check very quickly to see if I have that statistic with me. Um, we had 62% last year in 2018, 62% of next of kin decided to bury at Hart Island. Uh, we don't know precisely if it was because they, uh, financial constraints or other reasons, uh, because we don't solicit that from our families and we don't track that information. Uh, through anecdotal discussions with the families, we do know that 60 choose, 60% 60 choose to bury at Heart Island. 33% we were unable to find any next of kin. That was our uh, alternative. And then 5% uh, were families that really had no meaningful relationship with the uh, decedent and they chose to allow OCME to do the final disposition. Yeah. And I can tell you that most likely we can reduce the numbers of individuals being buried in that island by those, by those 62% if we, I mean the city, can work through HRA and increase the amount that individuals who are in, who can qualify to pay to cover the funeral expense will increase. Because what happened is that, and, and again, I put a resolution, I put an LS request on increasing the contribution, increasing the amount that uh, someone can qualify to, to cover the cost of funeral and bury the individual. That's the main reason why people decided to and I'm and I, and talking about my own experience and, and people that don't go to my office say, my family member died, we don't have the money to bury that individual. We don't, it's not 100% accurate, but based on our experience, I can say that most of those 62%, those families bury in Hard Island because they didn't have the money. And when those people go to our office and then we send them to Brooklyn to fill out the application that go through HRA, they only qualify for 11, by, for, 1100 that's not a, that's not a, a funeral most likely it costs like 2500 the lower cost or 4000 and what we've been told by the city is of course that hra is limited in that amount because that's how much the state is that accurate or is the city has some flexibility to increase that amount of of, of a a dollar that they can offer to cost to cover the cost of those individuals that they don't have enough to bury the loved one in another cemetery. The numbers you're saying are accurate, um, and it is governed by the state. The reimbursement is governed by the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will say that part of our intention and hope within the RFI is to help us to take a look at HRA's current burial services and to see how we can have a holistic plan for all low-income New Yorkers to give them options so that they're not faced with, this is my only option, I must do, not Hart Island, but a future state of, of a, a public burial. Um, and so we wanna, we wanna incorporate that into some of the questions that we solicit and the answers we solicit. Can the city increase the 1100 to cover the average cost of a funeral? To be honest, we don't know what the average cost of a funeral is in New York City. Let's say, let's say 2500 I can base about, we go to the funeral tees, the one close to a family, and it's most likely it's like twenty-five, three thousand dollars Yeah, part of what we, the, the funeral industry is quite um, uh, complicated and is not a transparent industry, and part of why we're seeking to do the RFI is to have a better understanding of what the true costs are. Um, so before we, I can answer if we should increase burial allowances, I need to, we need to have a better understanding of what true burials cost. But the HRA offer 1100 as assistance to family that they cannot afford to cover the cost. We offer up to 900. What's that? 900. 900. Is that, that, is that figure dictated by the city or is that the amount of data that the state allow HRA to cover? It's a state. Okay. So I think that we should work with a colleague in a state level to see how we can see an increase in that. And, and after 25 years, uh, have you, when you look about more than 100 years, you've seen the land of that hard island, has been 
has there been any point where you also recycle those bodies? That you, in, also, in order to maximize the space, you take some of those bodies and put it in a condensed in another place so that you can create opportunity to bury, bury more people? Um, disinterments only occur at the request of either the medical examiner or, or a private family member. But not to create capacity? Not, not to create capacity, no. Okay. Uh, again, with that one, uh, Park, uh, have you put a look about the possibility of turning down those buildings in Hart Island and using for other, or giving another use? Um, so it would be the City Department of Buildings uh, to best assess uh, the condition of those buildings, as, as Chair Levine noted, you know, they are certainly old buildings and many are cl ju clearly just it from site and, and tough, no one is, yeah. you know, so I think there's a further discussion to have with, with DOB and other entities about the, uh, the structural integrity uh, of, of those structures. Okay. On, on, a, on transportation, it, what considerations should be made when revising the transportation to and from Hard Island? Thank you, Chairman Rodriguez. We would want to first uh, coordinate with our agency partners to understand what the level of service is before understanding what adjustments need to be made to transportation services to and from Hart Island. How often is the ferry use? Uh, we transport uh, Tuesdays to Fridays and then once a month on weekends. And what do you use the ferry for? Do you use the ferry for other purposes? No, the ferry is used to transport uh, individuals and vehicles to Hart Island. So it makes sense that we don't have to wait for this a, a legislation to make like a daily a travel to the island. It's only like five minutes, 15 minutes, okay, from City Island to there. So do, the, do you think that it's possible to make like a daily visit to the island? Well, I think we first want to understand like how many more individuals would want to be going to Hart Island, and we'd also want to understand what the impacts to traffic are to the surrounding community. Because to get to Hart Island, it would require individuals to travel to City Island, so we would want to understand first like what the impacts to the surrounding community are going to be. As you're looking at this legislation, are you also looking at the possibility to connect ferry from Manhattan and Queens to Hart Island that they are not only coming from City Island? Well, right now, the ferry dock is not compatible with the standard DOT Staten Island ferry or the NYC ferry because it's a ferry that also accommodates vehicles and passengers, so that would also need to be studied in further detail. Have you started looking at that? Uh, you, not right now. Have you started looking at, at that possibility? So that's DOT? something that we are working with our agency partners to figure out what would happen on the island in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I would like to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Chaim Deutsch, uh, Councilmember Alika Ampri Samuel, and Councilmember Mark Joni. We were previously joined by Councilmember Carlos Menchaca, and I'm going to cue our Acting Parks Chair, Andy Cohen, for questions. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that this is a determinative factor, but do we, do we have any idea what it costs to run Hart Island, what it costs to bury a person on Hart Island? Uh, I, you know, I, I realize that there's a, a multi-agency approach here already. I guess DOT is, tra is, doing, is responsible for the transportation uh, and corrections is doing the burials, but do we have an idea of what it costs to? Thank you, Chair, for the question. So from the correction perspective, we spent about roughly um, $650,000 last year, and that was the cost of staffing for the island and equipment usage and you know the process of the burial. So I can't speak to the transportation costs. I defer to my colleague at the end of the table, but for us, it was roughly 650,000. Uh, and correction officers are assigned to Hart Island on a day that there's a burial. So there's a detail, a correction officer detail assigned there's Monday through Friday. Monday is more of an administrative day where Tuesday through Friday is active burials. So we have one dedicated captain and five correction officers in addition to one civilian who's a heavy equipment operator. And then, and that's in addition to the DOT cost. Do we know what the DOT costs are to operate the ferry? The DOT cost is about $2 million. Uh, and that operates the ferry trips that we do, and we also have staffing of uh, one captain, one engineer, 
uh, one mate, uh, so three crews for the ferry, and then an additional two deck hands assigned to the dock to raise and lower the vehicle bridge. I don't, I, fortunately, I um, ran for the city council, so I don't need to do math, but I think that uh, $2,650,000 for 1,200 burials sounds like a lot. I mean, I wonder, I mean, if we could do better by New Yorkers and do better by the taxpayer, uh, just in terms of the amount of money we have allocated to this effort that, that is dysfunctional, it doesn't work. I, I, I don't, I, I mean, you haven't actually articulated, but I, I don't think DOC really is the appropriate agency to be in this, to be providing this service to New Yorkers. I think that that's part of the, the or at the crux of some of the complications to coming up with a more feasible and workable and respectful solution to New Yorkers. Um, so I, I'm, uh, I mean, it seems to me that the elements are here that I, I'm, I'm almost speechless of the amount of money it costs to operate the island and the, and the, the, the cost of the ferry service. Do you know how many, uh, in, in terms of the Saturday, monthly Saturday visitation, do you know how many people uh, come to the island on a typical Saturday or, or, or how many came last year? You give me a moment, I have that information. I appreciate it. If you could also find the Thursday information, I'd like that too. So roughly uh, 50 individuals sign up for public visits per month. 15% don't show up. And about 15% do not um, show up. So we have a set schedule and we'll have um, the groups established for the, the trip over. And then the day of, then there'll be potential um, individuals who cannot come for a reason unknown to us or cancellations in advance. So when we do have the cancellations in advance that we can prepare for, we will, if there's anyone on a waiting list, we will reach out to those um, individuals to let them 50, know an opening. 50 is the capacity that you can accommodate in, a, in, a, in an individual? It's just what we see as the, the number of individuals requesting um, to visit. Um, and if we have, like I had said, if we had a wait list and we have cancellations we know of in advance, we'll reach out to those individuals that are on the wait list to accommodate them. And, and that's the Saturday visits? I have this as just 50 visitors, but I can go back and see what dif uh, differentiation we have available and provide and, that. And mm -hmm. Thursday. And can I, uh, can I ask, if we have a wait list, that means there is a capacity? Typically, uh, in the last several months, we have only had one waitlisted individual. So generally, um, for the month of May, we had one. So what would get us to the wait list? How many people? Were that I don't have on me, but I can get that back to you. Okay. Um, and I, I don't know if anybody is here is qualified to testify to this, but there's been discussion of green burial. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what that term means. Did, did, I don't know if DOC has or anybody has any idea of what that means or what. Uh, Can't speak uh, to. If the RFI is sort of uh, tackles that issue. So the hope of the RFI is to look at not only what is currently happening in New York City, but also we're gonna look at all the other jurisdictions. So we have been doing some um, research ahead of time, and we know that many jurisdictions do cremation and not burial. We know some jurisdictions just began to allow compost burials. I can't explain to you the science of that. I'm a social worker. Uh, it's my limit. Um, but that's the hope of the RFI is, you know, has the speaker alluded to wanting to make sure that we have um, input from stakeholders and from the council? That's the whole purpose of the RFI, to make sure that we have that kind of input coming in. Um, and we do believe it will be a collaborative process. And we'll look at what LA does, and what Chicago does, and uh, San Francisco, other very densely populated cities. I mean, no one's as densely populated as New York. Um, so we have our specific challenges, but we'll look to other experts for sure. Does, it, does has New York City ever offered cremation as, a, as an option? OCME does not. If, uh, if the family requests a city burial, it would be That's an actual burial at Hard Island. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Acting Chair. And now I'd like to cue one of our bill sponsors, Councilmember Debbie Rose. Thank you, Chair. Um, in uh, intro 1580, uh, it specifically uh, this addresses this formation of a task force. 
And on that task force, um, there's the Health and Hospitals Corp, the Health and Hospitals Corporation, the commissioners of health, mental hygiene, social services, corrections, the medical examiner, three members appointed by the mayor, two advocates, and um, a member of the public, um, and two council members. Um, when you discussed the task force before, um, are you in support of the task force for um, this, for Hearts Island? We're in support of getting as much input and feedback from all constituents and all members that we can throughout the process. I think we have to talk about the details and how a task force um, would interplay with a timeline to be able to move quickly forward to um, much, much of our planning uh, is reliant on what comes out of what our next phase can be. And so we want to do that as, as quickly as possible. But we, we look forward to talking with you and figuring out the best path forward with that. So you're, you're saying that you're willing to get feedback from all of these entities. They'll, and what form will that be? How, what will the structure be if it's not a task force? So our goal, the RFI is the structure for that. So the RFI is different than an RFP. An RFI is seeking out information from anyone is open to respond to it. Our goal, it, it permits for a structured process for that to happen so that we can do some back-end research and say these are the open-ended questions that we're not, that we don't have the expertise because no one currently is doing this kind of work. And then the RFI will seek responses from individuals um, and we anticipate and hope that it's a, a variety of individuals from stakeholders to council members um, to other city agencies as well. Okay, and what would the timeline be for that? And you think that's, um, Easy, more easily expedited than a task force um, doing the same, the same work and bringing that same information back? I believe that our timeline for the RFI is to release it in early fall and that we would close the RFI in um, six, six weeks to two months or so. So yeah, I do believe it would be um, a faster process forward. And that would then expedite the timeline that um, we're talking about that has been projected to be eight to 10 years in? Let me, so we believe that the capacity, our, the Department of Corrections testified to, but they said that the capacity on the island is anticipated to be eight to 10 years. HRA has urgency around finding a path forward much faster than eight to 10 years. We're committed to serving, that's our agency's mission, to assuring that we serve low-income New Yorkers with dignity and respect, and we believe that needs to happen quickly. Um, so the RFEI will then seek information back from uh, this list of stakeholders that we've identified? Absolutely, and we look forward to um, council helping us <coughs> assure that we reach all of the um, individuals that would have good input to put to and respond to the RFI. And how are you going to address the um, the rules and the reg regulations, policies, and procedures um, regarding public burials um, if, in fact, you work outside of this framework? So some of the rules and regulations are city rules and regulations, and that as we get information back from the RFI, I think that that will be very instructive into what needs to change. Some of the rules and regulations are state, um, and the the cemetery industry is governed by the state and is very highly regulated. Um, so I'm not sure the RFI or a task force would be able to address the state regulations, but I do think that the information that comes back from the RFI will inform not only our legislative affair folks, but hopefully also the council members if there's um, things that together we need to advocate on. Um, I had a conversation with my public administrator, and um, this is for HRA, and um, it was stated that there's, they're having much difficulty accessing burial reimbursement funds, um, which uh, amount to $900 um, for burials under $1,700. Um, we do have a friends of account, a non nonprofit that, um, you know, has been trying to access these funds. How, in fact, do we access them? What is the timeline? 
and why has this become difficult to do? In order, in order to access our burial program? The, um, the, to, the funds, burial reimbursement mm -hmm. funds that um, the public administrator's office sure. has. So we've been, at HRA, we've been taking a look at our burial program for the last several months. Um, we did an internal audit to understand why we were having denials, and we came forward with some things that needed improvement, and some of them were, um, we had some onerous documentation that we believe isn't necessary. Um, part of the process when we're looking to be able to re, um, pay for some portion of someone's burial is that um, we can look in our um, welfare management system to see if they were a low-income individual on cash assistance or social security. So moving forward, we hope that there'll be less documentation that a loved one will have to present to say, yes, they have no funds, because we hopefully will be able to see it in our system. That's the first phase. And then the second phase is we anticipate putting um, our burial application um, on Access HRA, which um, I hope, as everyone knows, is available on your uh, phone or computer, and to make it uh, much easier for someone who's this is a very challenging time for anyone who's dealing with burying their loved one. And so we want to make it as, um, as easy as possible. We're talking a, a partner in government. We're talking the public administrator's office. And if they have difficulty accessing um, and getting the reimbursement, um, what is the public actually um, you know, experiencing? Mm -hmm. And what is the timeline for this? Um, I guess uh, the enlightening we're going to put it on on the website and and how do you plan to make you know constituents knowledgeable about this process and and how to get it especially since this is a very distressing time so we're looking at revamping some of our outreach that we've done um, to work with places like the Public Administrator's Office to get it in a more prominent place on our website. Um, and we do really think that the streamlining the documentation will have a significant impact on the ease for individuals and for the Public Administrator's Office. Um, that documentation streamlining is happening right now and should be completed in the next several, um, several months, I would say, by the end of the summer or so. Um, and then in terms of getting it online, um, that uh, I don't have that timeline with me exactly, but um, it's, in, it's in our queue of things that need to get online. And I just want to circle back to the RFEI. Um, the timeline for, um, for its uh, issuance mm -hmm. is when and then when, how long will it take you to move on, on the recommendations that you receive? Sure. Um, so our, we plan to release by the beginning of the fall, this fall, um, and then the, it will be open for comment and uh, responses for six, to two, six weeks to two months. Um, and then we'll take the next several months to gather the information that we received. Um, and that will be instructive to say, what we don't know is if we need one vendor to do this moving forward, if we need to offer three different options. Um, and that's what will determine how long the process will take in order to take the next step forward. Okay. Um, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Rose. And I do want to express my strong support for your bill to create a task force. An RFEI is agency driven, and the task force you're proposing would, by design, bring in advocates, experts, people outside of government, maybe even family members with loved ones buried on the island, or people with expertise in environmental uh, cemetery uh, techniques. And that guarantees a more a global and diverse perspective. Course. And that's why we support that. And regarding the cost, you know, as, as Council Member uh, or Acting Chair Cohen uh, uncovered through his uh, formidable math skills, uh, <laughs> You're certainly spending more than $1,100 per burial currently on Hart Island. So it might even just make economic sense for the city, um, the humanitarian arguments as well, to up the reimbursement rate um, so that families who would rather not have their loved one on Hart Island have other options. And it might save the city a little bit of money in the process. 
wouldn't be the primary motivation. Our humanitarian concerns are paramount, um, but the, the, the math here uh, is pretty compelling. Uh, I'm going to now cue uh, for questions Councilman Richards to be followed by Councilmember Holden and Councilmember Jonai. Thank you, Chairs, for this, this important hearing. Um, I guess the first question I have is, do you have the demographical breakdown of who's buried at the island? So based on race, I'm, I'm interested in knowing st statistics on that. Forgive my wisdom too today. Uh, needs to be pulled. But anybody can give me a demographical breakdown. Thank you, Council Member. That's probably an OCME question. Uh, we collect as much information as we can from the um, uh, custodial uh, entities like hospitals and uh, nursing homes that transfer decedents to us for, uh, as our, in our mortuary function. So um, that information, it, whatever we can get from them, we do get. Um, we also collect information from our own death scene investigations uh, and we collect as much as possible uh, for the forensic cases. Um, we are a primarily uh, an agency whose primary mission is science serving justice. Um, when it comes to demographic analysis and those indicators uh, on the causes of people uh, buried at Heart Island, that would not be within our area of expertise. Um, and again, our data is uh, made possible by the information that we're able to collect at the time that we receive the decedent. Would you say majority of people at Heart Island that are buried are people of color? I would not be able to say that. I, I'm happy to go back and see if I can uh, try to get some of that information, but no, I, I would not be able to speak to that. Okay. I just want to be clear because I think we're beating around the conversation of race here. And, um, you know, I may not be politically correct in my, in my statement, but, you know, if I was a betting person, the data would reflect that majority of these individuals are black and brown people who have no other means of being buried and whose lives obviously don't seem to matter that much, um, at least in the eyes of this city. Uh, so I know it's an uncomfortable statement, um, but I think we need to, to address the issue that we're trying to address. We have to be very clear on what's happening and why it's happening, and race and geography and socioeconomics all play a role, because guess what? If it didn't, we would have that answer. Um, let me also say this. I, I, so can you just go through, you said there are detainees or inmates who help with burials. Can you just take me through that again? How many participate in this program? Sure. So Why the, do they participate in this program? So the um, inmate assignment detail um, for Heart Island is developed at what is called the inmate assignment office um, in EMTC, which is the um, facility for city sentenced individuals and there um, it's not a involuntary process so city sentence worker city it's sentence not a voluntary process I'm sorry <laughs> let me correct my statement so there are city sentence work individuals um, perform work functions throughout Rikers Island and and the borough facilities so the um, inmate assignment office within the facility will select the individuals based on whatever certain reasons and criteria to be assigned to Heart Island. It is certainly not um, You go through the criteria, sorry to cut you off. I'm sorry. Good morning, thank you for your question. So all city sentenced inmates are required to work unless they're the mental um, health or me uh, medical issue which would preclude them from working. Um, that determination is made by um, our medical provider and uh, there are um, there's a there's a series of determinations that are made based on the, um, the classification score or the reason that the individual is incarcerated um, when they are assigned by the inmate job assignment office to a function. So specifically speaking to this um, job assignment, the um, incarcerated individual would have to be, at a minimum, 
um, still have three months left on their sentence and um, not have any um, either classification or mental health or uh, medical reason why they could not um, perform the job function. That's the simplest um, answer. I'm trying to really understand this. I'm kind of struggling with this for a second. So you mean to tell me individuals we're supposed to be trying to rehabilitate are tasked with going to Heart Island, a place where perhaps if I had a family member they can't even visit, and they're tasked with burying individuals? So just take me through. I am telling you that our... What, what exactly are they doing? I am telling you that incarcerated individuals are required to work and that we do have incarcerated individuals who perform functions on Heart Island. So their job is to bury the dead um, when we should be teaching them how to live first off. And the other part about this that's troubling, I don't know if anybody else is struggling with this, is the mere fact that we can't find vocational programming on Rikers Island to really help people lead productive lives when they leave the island, but we can find time for them to be on some secluded island, um, once again, where family members can't even reach or the general public can't go to bury people. Do you not find something, I'm, I'm struggling with this, I'm, do you not find something wrong with this? Because as a city, we should certainly find this, something wrong with this. You mean to tell me we couldn't find individuals who do this sort of work outside of Rikers Island? to focus on this, we couldn't find burial companies, I don't know, nonprofits, whomever, but we are taking people who we're supposed to be trying to rehabilitate, and then you said, um, strike, they have to have some mental health issues. Uh, you don't think you're gonna have mental health issues being on some secluded island burying people? You're gonna leave Rikers Island with that tattered in your mind forever, and when you come out, how, how are you rehabilitated? I thought that's what prison was supposed to be about. I, I don't know if I'm crazy, but I, maybe I'm just, I'm just reading this wrong. I think we should totally ban this practice from happening, period, for people who are locked up. I don't think anybody on Rikers Island should have to endure being on this island doing any burial work or work, period. Let's find vocational programming which we've heard from people on the island specifically from, that they are looking for that can teach them life skills so that when they leave Rikers, they can go on to their productive lives. So Unless they're getting ground, into the burial. Grounds duty, uh, mm -hmm. grounds duty uh, functions on Hart Island are not the only jobs being performed. I don't care uh, what it that's is. A, well, if I could <laughs> just finish, please, thank you. Um, yeah. We do have other vocational um, programs and we'd be, happy to discuss um, those programs that are available I, to I'm our aware of the vocational population I don't um, on cut Rikers you off. Island, thank you. But I've been to Rikers Island, I did a visit last summer and I heard from a lot of the older folks in there that they are not seeing adequate programming. So we need to retune this and really redefine what rehabilitation looks like for individuals on Rikers. I, I, I don't want to beat this drum, but <laughs> you know, this, this is all broken. And, um, and then let's just go back, if I, sorry, if you can just indulge me for two more minutes. Can you take me through the visitation days again and hours? So what days can family members visit or individuals? Sure, thank you for the question. So for the monthly gazebo visits, which are public visitation, not necessarily gravesite specific, those occur every once a month on Thursdays. And then for gravesite visits, they occur once a month on Saturdays on a predetermined schedule where family members can sign up um, in advance and bring along um, individuals of their choice to come for a family visit. Mm -hmm. um, typically, the, we have two trips over, 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. Um, in general, then neither trips are full. Not so 9 a.m. to 12 p.m.? 12 p.m., yes. So if you work, you gotta take a day off of work. And if you're Jewish, how do you visit on a Saturday? Well, the visits are on, on a Saturday. Saturday or Sunday, we do alternate. If you have Sabbath. Yeah, we do alternate. Um, How often do you alternate? 
it depends on the schedule. I'm, I'm assume, once a month, we should be alternating. Um, and then for the groups that are going over, we're, we're typically never at capacity. So we'll have groups scheduled to as much capacity as we can. And then that day, we may have individuals that don't come for reasons we don't, we're not aware of. And um, if we have cancellations in advance, if a wait list exists, which generally it does not, we will reach out to those individuals on the wait list to accommodate them. And how many people are buried there again? In, one million. In, in total, one, one million. One million, and you never at capacity. For visitors, no. That's a shame. That means we, we got work to do. That means people are unaware where their loved ones are, and it also points to a bigger issue of access. So if you have a million people and you can't fill a boat <laughs> once a month or twice a month, that points to a larger systematic issue. Um, so I want to thank the chairs and thank everybody who sponsored this legislation. Um, you know, I think these people's lives do matter. Sorry if it's uncomfortable, but we got to call it what it is. These are largely black and brown people who are buried, out of sight, out of mind, and the city is treating, treating them, literally, as if they don't matter. And then, to add <laughs> more fires, f uh, flames to the fire, we are having people who are locked up <laughs> go and bury them. That's Th all I have to say. Th thank, thank you, you. Councilmember. Um, and we're, we're going to pass it next to Councilmember Holden. We, we haven't put a clock on the members, but I just want to remind you we have a very, very long list of public testimony that we're waiting for. So if, if folks can just be respectful of time. And please, Councilmember Holden. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to echo some of what um, Speaker Johnson was talking about, that it, this should be actually be a, a visit to a cemetery, and it shouldn't have to be 12 day business days in advance. Why is it 12 days in advance to, to make an appointment? Who, who, who arrived at that number? Is that historically done? That's the way it was I, always done? I'd have to get back to you on the specific one that um, procedural policy was put in place. Um, what I can tell you is that um, no one is turned away. So um, I know that um, Captain Thompson and our Office of Constituent and Grievance Services who schedule um, the, the visits does everything that they can to make the uh, visits as accessible to um, those who wish to visit Hard Island. So I want to ask the panel, do, do, does anybody here think that all the regulations to get on this island, all the things being done, is that fair to the people, to the families, or to, to friends to visit the island this way? Does anybody feel that, because we're supposed to be the fairest big city. Is this fair? <clears throat> I think that we're all in agreement that DOC has done the best that they can do with the resources that they have, but that having DOC continue to do the burials is not the path forward that the city wants to take, which is why we've stated everything we have today that we want to have a path forward to transfer the island into the custody of, uh, custody? I don't know if that's right. Jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, excuse me, of Parks Department. Um, and we're committed not to use um, inmates to do burials moving forward. And, and is there only, there's visitation only because of a lawsuit? Is that? Is that true? No. no. So the department over the course of this administration has been in a series of transformation efforts. And those transformation efforts and reform efforts encompass all of our duties. So that includes Rikers Island and the borough facilities and our other operations, which include Hart Island. I can't speak to the past, but I know going forward, we are doing the best we can to provide opportunities and um, resources for Hart Island in the best of our ability. Well, well DOC, yeah, d d yes, you, you may, but I think as a city, we're not. Uh, we're not doing the best we can in this. And um, uh, I would say it's easier to visit a prison or a jail than to visit Hart Island. And it's, that's outrageous. And so we need to, like, I, I want to echo Speaker Johnson again. This has to be fixed and fixed right away. And it shouldn't be, it shouldn't take years to figure this out. And, to, and I, I agree that we, uh, if we fix Hart Island and we can make it into, uh, the Parks Department will take over, make it into a, a pleasant place to visit historically and so on, that we can continue to bury 
the dead there, because otherwise it becomes more blighted if, if everything ends and there's not really a plan and years from now it's just dropped if we stop the burial. So I think it has to be active, it's historical, and we should fix this, but fix it uh, very quickly. And I, I think it, the resolve has to be from the mayor's office, and I think we can do this, and, but certainly the city council, you're hearing the city council speak and, and, and have concerns. 12 business days is a joke to have to try to get on Hard Island. So I've been, um, I'm told and I've been handed, handed a card um, with information that states that the 12-day um, was a result of a cla class action suit agreement um, uh, with the ACLU. So that is the origin of the 12 days. 12 days. All right. And, so, and you have to show photo ID. Any other cemeteries require that in the city of New York? Photo ID, a government-issued photo ID? I am I'm told that no one is turned away for not uh, displaying, um, showing, having yeah, a possession I mean, why, why and, have a, and a, a why? photo ID. Somebody going to do something on the island, and what's going to happen? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Holden, and uh, now Councilmember Jonai. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to echo some of the passion that was heard in our speaker's voice, and I. I know that we're under time constraints and there's so many questions to be asked. I just have to refer to the testimony from 2016 to follow up on a question by one of our colleagues. And this was submitted by New York City Department of Corrections. Only sentenced inmates who have good behavior records are selected to work on Hart Island. The inmates who work on the island learn job skills, get to be outside and off of Rikers Island for a few hours a day and perform meaningful service for the community. Just want to repeat that first part. Only inmates who have good behavior as a reward get to bury New Yorkers. That's your 2016 testimony. And I want to continue echoing on some of the questions. We should be judged by how the remains of our deceased are treated, how the families that are lack options, and we've created an environment where we deter visitation, not encourage it, but actually deter it. You uh, earlier stated, I believe, that no one's turned away with, if they don't have a valid ID. Is that correct? That is what I've been told, yes. So let's look at the, the second paragraph there. Vis visitors must register with the Department of Corrections before a scheduled visit and provide a valid government-issued photo ID if over the age of 16. So if I was in undocumented immigrant here. And I was giving that, and I'm not sure in what language those are provided to begin with. What do you think I would do when I came to that paragraph? And I have no form of ID, but yet I have a loved one on that island. I'm asking anyone to respond. What do you think the natural response would be from that individual? I'll answer for you. I guess I don't qualify to visit my mother, my father, my sibling, in short. And to hear the words that are being used that we're going to look into, that we're in a process of transforming, we're reforming, we'll get back to you when this has been going on for years and for decades. Let's go to a letter that was submitted back in March 13th of 1985 that indicated Presently, 48 inmates were living on the island. Is anyone currently living on the island? No. no. But you, is there a reason why no one's living on the island? We don't house inmates on Hard Island. But 
Should there should Heart Island have twenty four hour security? I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, I'm asking the question because obviously we make those that want to visit the island dance through hoops. The only thing that we don't have them go through is metal detectors. They have to submit their phones. They can't take pictures. They can't come at a day that's convenient for them without registering 12 days in advance, which means there was a setup here for some security purpose to give 12 day notice, must show photo ID, ask questions that are quite intimidating for New Yorkers as to why they, why they would have to answer them is beyond logic to visit a loved one. Give them restrictions, dates, access, hours. Is there a restroom on the island? I got an answer to that question right now. Let me understand this right. We have one million New Yorkers buried here. We've created a protocol that makes it almost impossible if, or let's call it inconvenient, for many to be able to visit. We lack information of next of kin to find the remains of their loved ones. We don't have bathroom facilities. You're constrained to a time frame for visitation. You have no cell phone use and no pictures. I just have to echo the words of the speaker. We should all be embarrassed. And we should be held accountable. Were any of you here for the 2016 testimony? I was. With the Parks Department. What have you done since 2016 to correct these embarrassing conditions? Uh, I'll defer to DOC about the, the conditions and efforts that have been undertaken since then, but I will you know, again highlight that the city is here because we're committed to finding another model for these burials. And I, you Let's know, we just find another model. That. Let's go back to this, the, the, while you're thinking of another model, right? March 13, 1985. A skull was also seen on the beach area. It was explained to us that this was rather common thing to happen since the city has been burying bodies there for almost 80 years and the water has caused some erosion on the older burial spots. This is 1985, 2011, 2012, 2016, and again in 2019. But let me guess, where we're forming, right, is what we're looking at, we're transferring, we're looking into, of the $13.1 million received from FEMA to reinforce the shorelines, how much of that has been used for the two year, I guess it's two year, 2016 to 2018, you came up with a um, plan of action? So the design for the shoreline restoration began in 2016. So the work from essentially 2013, because the Hurricane Sandy occurred in 2012, there was time that needed to be um, done to assess what had happened to the island and to work with the federal government and OMB to gain the resources we needed to begin the project. So in 2016, after all that work was done, the FEMA project worksheets were approved, design contract was registered, we began the design of the shoreline restoration. That's a two-year process. It affects the north, east, and west shorelines. The north shoreline is where there has been documented bone exposure. Um, then, post the design um, completion in 2018, we proceeded to do the construction bid. The construction bid registered, in 2019 at a cost of five million. So the total package, yes, is 13 million, which includes the support from FEMA as well from the, as from the city, for the city's match for those FEMA funds. Um, and five million is the cost of the construction, which is slated to begin in July and conclude in 2021 to restore the shoreline. Is there anything that can be, any, has there been an assessment of the last storm that we had? We've had this whole month, the last two months have been very rainy, we had some terrible storms. Is there anyone out there making assessments of the deterioration of the soil and preventing further bones from 
uh, washing out onto the Long Island Sound? Yes, so as part of this project, we have an archeological consultant who is continually assessing what is going on on the island and providing reports to us on a quarterly basis, if not sooner, depending on the conditions, so we can address them in real time. What are those reports indicating? Can you share with us? I don't have the details of all the reports, but we can certainly provide them to your office. Have there been any bones that have washed out into Long Island Sound within the last two months with all these heavy rains and some of the storms that we've had? Not that I'm aware of. Do you know that the when the last report was issued? April. Chair, I'm great. April. Thank you for the consideration of time. April. Did that April report indicate that there are still bones and the remains of New Yorkers washing out in, or any part of the remains washing out into the Long Island Sound. I'm just surprised you have to look it up because if I ever read something like that, it would haunt me. It would prevent me from sleeping at night. That if I knew remains were being washed out into a sound, I would not have to go look through the records of a report. So based on this report, the consultant acknowledges the concern for the soil stability. There is not any indication that remains have been washed up recently, and it recommended a visit subsequent to this report being issued to continue, a, a visit within April, so right after the report was issued, to continue to monitor the situation. Chair, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And it's an embarrassment, it's more than that, we should actually be held accountable for the lack of compassion of the deceased, their families, it's beyond an embarrassment, it's disgraceful. And I would encourage you to actually dig a little bit further into the testimonies that we've heard over the years. Let's revisit them, and I think we'll have a redundancy because at this point someone should be held accountable and someone's head should be knocked off. Not sure I would go with that uh, analogy, but I certainly agree uh, uh, that this is a serious, serious problem that has to be fixed as soon as possible. And I thank you, uh, Councilmember Joni. And we are now going to um, go to public testimony, and I thank the administration. And we have also been joined by fellow Health Committee member, Councilmember Inez Barron. And I'd like to call up. Uh, the next panel, which will be Melinda Hunt. I'm having a hard time reading the name, but Herbert, uh, maybe. Okay. Is is that Herbert? Is Her Mr. Herbert one of them? It's, it's fine, that's great. And they filled out f slips, correct? Okay, so I have Elsie Soto, is, is Elaine Joseph as well? Okay, and, okay, as long as everyone has filled out a slip, that's fine. I see Tammy Martino, and uh, is Mr. Herbert also uh, available? Okay, sir, please. Okay, uh, thank you all very much. We, we are unfortunately gonna have to use a clock at this point because of the long list of people who wanna testify, but we'll try and be flexible to the extent we can. Um, uh, and w would you like to, to kick us off, Melinda? Can you make sure your microphone is on? Is it on? Yeah, okay. Um, Thank you so much, Councilman Levine, um, for chairing this, I think this is our third or fourth hearing. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that the City Council is considering transferring jurisdiction of Hart Island to, to, from the Department of Correction to the Department of Parks. I am really disheartened that they are thinking about ending the burials <coughs> there. 
Uh, as I've said before, I think that Heart Island is an asset to the city that is being managed as a liability. Um, although the Department of Correction has not recently recycled graves, it is legal in New York State to recycle graves, and New York City has recycled graves. Therefore, Heart Island is the largest natural burial ground in the country. And our laws support this already. They do not support cremation. I was really outraged to hear um, Human Resource Administration that they're looking at Chicago and LA and whatnot, when New York State has some of the best laws regarding cemeteries in the country, and we have a very good department of cemeteries right in Manhattan, why are they going to LA? They can walk downtown to Wall Street and speak to the director of cemeteries, and they should be better informed. So that was absolutely outrageous. I also feel that the testimony from the Department of Parks was really a perfect illustration of how people are buried in bureaucracy in this city. And I, I am really grateful to Speaker Johnson for his sense of outrage. This is just not acceptable. And I'm also grateful to um, Councilman Joni, whose district this is in, for him going back and looking at that uh, environmental report, the uh, Sanitation Department report from 1985 that clearly documented that there were human remains washing into the Long Island Sound. Back in 1985, I photographed it in 1992. It wasn't until last year when a pediatrician from uh, Lo Long Island who had a boat photographed it. You know, a licensed physician said, you know, you've got human remains coming out of the, out of this, out of the uh, northern slopes of Hart Island. I can see them from my boat. I'm a doctor. And that's how we got this acknowledgement. So um, it really is something that we need to take care of. So um, I'm a visual artist. I began documenting Hart Island in um, 1991 at the peak of the AIDS epidemic in New York City. When I first, oh there. P please continue. When I first visited Hart Island, I was surprised by the expansive beauty of this historic cemetery. I was expecting it to be a dark place. So many people my age in the arts community had died or disappeared as a result of AIDS. I was expecting to confirm the terrible stories I had heard about Potter's Field, a highly stigmatized biblical name for the burial ground of strangers. What I found instead was a willingness on the part of the Department of Correction to let me explore the island. I was granted permission to photograph every location except the interior of buildings. I spent three years putting together a photographic book which Joel Sternfeld published in 1998. I produced a film about Heart Island a decade later. I developed an interactive software to collect the stories of people buried on Heart Island known as the Traveling Cloud Museum. And I want to acknowledge, I don't know if Captain Thompson is still here, but um, he has done an excellent job. It's not his fault, he works for the wrong agency. Correction officers told me where to locate the grave of the first child to die of AIDS in New York City. Until last November, when Speaker Johnson and Councilman Rodriguez visited this area, no one I know had been permitted access. 16 adults who died from AIDS were buried in graves 14 feet deep below the water table on Hart Island and in an area formerly used for sewage treatment. I learned about these AIDS burials from, 19, from the 1985 sanitation report that was um, presented by Councilman Joni. Then during his visit this past December, Councilman Rodriguez called me to confirm that these graves are dated 1985 consistent with the sanitation report. From my work with Heart Island families, I learned that many whose burials of loved ones 
who died of AIDS were initially not intent, they did not intend to bury them on Heart Island. They recall trying to find a funeral director in New York City. Only a few funeral directors would even collect the body of someone who died of AIDS. For most families, city burial was the only option. Having the last hearing concerned the transfer of jurisdiction from Art Island was held on World AIDS Day in 2016, the same day the AIDS Memorial in New York City was dedicated. It was two more years before the city council could even visit AIDS graves on Hart Island. And that what we heard from Councilman Rodriguez today is that they, city council, the city council speaker was told to put away his cell phone, the speaker. However, I do feel, despite these obstacles, that we are moving toward a burial practice that is less stigmatized. Today is May 30th. This date is also important because Heart Island was a civil war camp for Union soldiers and Confederate, Confederate prisoners of war. And we have, um, we have a Vietnam veteran here today to talk about that. The present burial process of 150 bodies, not 500 bodies, laid out in a grid was first used during the civil war for managing battlefield field burials such that they could identify individuals within a common plot. So this is obviously a very successful system of burials because we've been using it for 150 years. This year marks the sesquicentennial of city burials on Hart Island and a paramilitary organization is still in charge. Even the national cemeteries are now managed by the National Park Service, not the military. The reformatory on Hart Island closed in 1966, the same day Memorial Day became a national holiday, and the Department of Correction tried to transfer jurisdiction of Hart Island to parks. This was 1966, over 50 years ago. Instead, Phoenix House moved on to Hart Island in 1967, and DOC began busing inmates from Rikers Island to perform the burials. Then in 1976, New York City canceled 24-7 ferry service, forcing Phoenix House to move and depriving the city of New York funding used to maintain and secure Hart Island that they got from New York State. This led City Cemetery to become isolated. Mitz Rosenthal, the founder of Phoenix House, remembers warning Mayor Beam before leaving Hart Island you're still gonna have to bury the dead. Vandals arrived almost immediately. On the last weekend of July 1977, arsonists set fire to the warden's house, destroying decades of burial records. A letter dated November 10th, 1981, DOC Commissioner ben Benjamin Ward writes, the Hearts Island burial grounds have been neglected for several years, that's 1981 due to budget restrictions and limited access to the island. That's because of the ferry service. Vandals invade Hart Island almost weekly for beer parties or worse. That speaks to what uh, Councilman Jonai was talking about. Is there security on the island 24-7? From 1981 to 1991, New York City funded a small contingent of in inmates to return to reside on the island to restore the war memorials and burial grounds. During this period, which ended shortly before I began visiting, DOC proposed building a new prison on Hart Island. However, an environmental lawsuit filed by City Island residents and decided in 1985 prevented the reopening of a prison. Now Hart Island can never return to being a city prison and there is no need for the Department of Correction to retain jurisdiction. In response to a class action lawsuit settled in 2015, New York City finally agreed to limited access for relatives of the buried. Now the mother of an infant wants, if she wants to visit her baby's grave, she must enter a prison facility. Visits are limited to one morning per month the mother must arrive at the city dock with government issued ID, a signed waiver agreeing not to sue the city, and a willingness to relinquish her cell phone. She is then escorted to the grave site on a prison bus, 
told when to get off, where to stand, which is either next to an open trench or in a vast field of numbered anonymous markers. Think about this experience of visiting a child's grave inside the prison system. People sign up and then have second thoughts. If they fail to show up, they are now waitlisted for six months. Nothing about the prison control of Heart Island is culturally acceptable. I'm one of a growing number of people who have come to believe that unembalmed burials in plain pine boxes, known as natural burials, are much better for the environment, especially in cities. The system of burials on Heart Island is both natural and sustainable, but there, need, there is no need to dig di gigantic trenches when the burials number fewer than 1,200 annually. Graves could be much smaller and closed within one month of being opened. Unlike private cemeteries, which are quickly running out of space, Heart Island has plenty of space. Although the Department of Correction has stopped recycling graves, there is no reason the city cannot and should not recycle graves older than 25 years. This was the practice up until 1977. Recycling graves should be part of an overall reforestation plan that involves planting trees and other vegetation as part of closing graves in order to mitigate erosion. Unclaimed remains that are released for city burial should be authorized. Bodies that are unidentified or where families have not agreed to a city burial could be stored in vaults created for that purpose on Heart Island. Bodies stored in vaults could be more easily returned to families without disturbing the common graves. There needs to be a clear policy, maybe a statute of limitations on the number of years that the city must hold an unclaimed or unidentified remains in a burial vault before burial. It is important for the burial process to be fair, consistent, and transparent. Because burial assistance does not cover the cost of even direct cremation, that's the $900 we're talking about, city burial is the only option for many people. Helping low-income residents apply for burial assistance doesn't mean that funeral directors will accept $900 for their services. The city should consider doubling burial assistance while educating the public about natural burials. These two things will go a long way to making Heart Island culturally acceptable choice instead of a dreaded necessity. By law, every unclaimed body in New York State is entitled to a decent burial, not cremation. It follows that a decent burial is not a prison burial, and the city council must act to end penal control over city cemetery. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melinda, and thank you for your leadership over, I guess, decades now. Um, as I said in my opening statement, you are almost single-handedly responsible for uh, forcing the public and city government to pay attention and for, for the first time offering families um, information they desperately wanted and needed uh, about the whereabouts of their loved ones. Uh, it shouldn't have taken an outside activist to do that, but we're grateful that you did step up and we know this fight is long from over, but I do want to acknowledge all the great success that you have helped to bring about. I'm excited to hear about the remaining panelists, but I, I um, committed an oversight by not inviting earlier um, a, a member of the administration who, if she's still here, uh, Edwina Francis Martin, who's a representative of the Staten Island. Yes, because I understand you're under time constraints, and as a administrative, administration representative, uh, we're welcome to have you. If you could maybe scoot in on the end, Edwina. Uh, a friend who's known to all of us around here is the count at the council, and again, a representative of the Richmond County Public Administrator. And um, thank you to the panel for allowing um, Ms. Martin to, to speak. We look forward to continuing to hear from the families, but now I'll cue you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levine. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, I, I think it's on now. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for calling me up, and um, thank you all for your work and your testimony. Um, I do want to clarify that I'm not a member of the administration. I'm actually a non-mayoral appointed commissioner. <laughs> um, so um, just for the record officially, my name is Edwina Francis Martin. I am the commissioner and public administrator of uh, Richmond County. I thank you for um, scheduling this oversight hearing today on Hart Island and the city's public burial process. And I particularly want to thank um, the committee chairs that are sponsoring this hearing, Council Member Levine, Council Member Rodriguez, and Council Member Cohen. Um, I testify today in support of um, intros 559 um, introduced by uh, Councilmember Ayala and intro 1580 introduced by Councilwoman Rose. The Office of the Public Administrator is a New York City agency, but it's created under the New York State Surrogate Court Act. Every borough has one, so that's why I'm a non-mayoral um, appointed commissioner. Um, our office, um, amongst other things, is responsible for the administration of the estates of persons that have left no will and where there are no qualified persons to administer the decedent's estate. Um, in Richmond County, um, one of the things that we take great pride in is providing for the burial arrangements when no close relative is available to do so of the estates that we administer. In fiscal year 2018, thanks in large part to member items funding allocated by Minority Leader Matteo and Councilwoman Rose, as well as donated services from Staten Island businesses, my office arranged for the dignified burials of 71 Staten Island residents, including 32 stillborn infants, preventing the fate of their being buried on Hart Island, as is in the practice of the city's other um, public uh, administrator offices um, in the other boroughs. The Staten Island community supports um, and indeed expects um, that all Staten Islanders, regardless of wealth and standing in life, deserve a burial on Staten Island in the place that may be visited in an accurately recorded grave site from which the remains may be exhumed should a close family member sub subsequently come forward by cemetery professionals in a quality casket in the thoughtful presence of those to whom care of the remains have been entrusted. Um, I have attended um, a little over a dozen burials since I began my position in January. Um, we have volunteers who come um, and join us, and they're really thoughtful, beautiful um, events, um, and uplifting in many ways. Um, also, anyone who wants to visit anyone that we bury can find them. They don't need any ID. The only constraint are the hours of the cemetery where they are buried. Honoring this longtime Staten Island commitment requires um, the aforementioned member item funding, the generosity of local funeral directors and cemeteries, the cooperation of area hospitals and care facilities, and the office of the chief medical examiner, amongst others. My office works closely with Hebrew Free Burial um, and the Arch Archdiocese of New York for decedents of the Jewish and Catholic faiths respect respectfully. Neither of these um, charge an opening or other fees. We also work with Ocean View Cemetery on Staten Island for all other faiths, and these are all burials on non-titled land. For veteran decedents, we work with the Mayor's Office of Veteran Services to provide low or no cost burials. We receive no budget allocation from the city, um, nor are we reimbursed for the cost of these burials. Indeed, HRA has said to us um, that the public administrator may not access burial reimbursement funds. So we worked with a not-for-profit to create a designated Friends of organization, the Foundation of Dignity, which, as Councilwoman Men Rose mentioned earlier in her questioning, also has not been able to access any reimbursement funds due to many um, bureaucratic roadblocks put up by HRA. So in sum, we rely on annual member item allocations and donations of professional services, caskets and grave sites from business owners to provide these burials. 
The creation of a task force that would review and reconsider the operating framework for Heart Island and the services the city provides in connection with the burial of the indigent, as provided for in intro 1580, would hopefully take into consideration the work of offices such as mine and the Foundation of Dignity. And um, when redesigning um, how burial arrangements are made, um, sort of take into account the reimbursement process. Um, I, I know I, I listened to their testimony carefully about how they were changing it. I actually don't think it's going to um, change any of the experience that the Foundation of Dignity um, has had based on um, what I was listening to. Um, likewise, the creation of an office to support those in need of burial assistance, such as provided in intro 1559, will, I believe, not only further what has been my mission since assuming office on January 1st, of dignity and compassion in connection with the burial and treatment of all, but will also be another avenue of support as we work to provide dignified burials for all Staten Islanders. Um, I, I want you to please accept my appreciation for the amazing work that the City Council does day in, day out, 24-7, to uplift all New Yorkers. Um, thank you for allowing me to testify today, and I am happy to take any questions when the, when the panel finishes. Thank you, Madam Commissioner, uh, for that testimony. It's great to be able to use that title. <laughs> and great to have your perspective. Um, Thank you. I, I actually learned a lot in that testimony I didn't know, so we appreciate that. Um, I know that the, the council member, uh, our co-chair, uh, Rodriguez, just had a quick statement before we continue. I just want to apologize if I don't get to hear the testimony of everyone. I had to go to the other room since there's a hearing also on the BQX. That is about transportation that I also had to step out a little bit and come back. But, you know, without the Heart Island Project and Melinda and all of you guys, we would not be here today. So, and we will continue conversation. One other thing that probably we should work together is to see how we can do our next walk to the Heart Island, something that probably we can do together. But I will be back, but if I miss the testimony of some of you, it's because I'm going to be in the next room in the other hearing too. Thank you. It's a busy day around City Hall. Um, we have been rejoined by um, your fellow Staten Islander and one of the bill sponsors, uh, Councilmember uh, Rose. Uh, did you want to make a question or comment to the commissioner? Please, yes. I did. I, I want to thank you um, for indulging me. Uh, we're in budget negotiating um, team meetings right now, fighting for money to make sure that all of the folks that need money and resources are, are getting it. So um, please excuse me being in and out. Um, but I heard um, as I was leaving um, this room to go to BNT from an advocate that uh, you don't feel that your voices have been significantly heard in terms of any of the rules, regulations, or even the new train of thought that um, they're now um, anticipating. Um, can you just elucidate for me um, what would make it easier for you, you, for your voices to be heard, for you to actually have an impact on, um, on, on the new changes being proposed. And if you think that the task force is a, a good idea. Um, well, it's news to us because I have for many years tried to set up meetings with the Parks Department to have a discussion and they refuse to meet. Same thing with the medical examiner. Um, and I didn't know HRA was involved until today. So I, f I, f I feel that they have refused to meet with us intentionally. They are not genuine about wanting to manage Heart Island or come up with a plan. The park's position has been that they will only manage cemeteries that are not active, even though there are two cemeteries in New York City that are active um, and it, it works just fine. 
but they've just dug in their heels on this. So I think what you were talking about, the structure of this task force, there, there are, we would be totally outnumbered in that particular structure. I think it's much better than what they were proposing, but you still need to have more representation of members of the public who are actually working with family members. We've worked with over 500 families. We have 2,800 people registered. A number of families are across the, in different parts of the country and have submitted testimony today but could not be here. And these are people who have suffered as a result of New York City's uh, neglect of this um, essential service. This is not discretionary funding, this is an essential city service. And I, I know, uh, Councilman Jonah, you, you missed my testimony, but I do, I do, I did add stuff in in response to your, what your concerns for were, and I think you're right on the money for this. This is in your district, it's a total disgrace. And they have, they knew that this was, these, there was erosion in 1985 and they did nothing. So, and it's not the fault of the Department of Correction that they're simply the wrong agency. Parks has refused jurisdiction since 1966. That's where we are. Um, in in the, the language of the bill says at least, so, um, what is a good number, at least two advocates who specialize in issues related to public burial or Heart Island, um, which would be appointed by the um, Speaker of the City Council, and at least one member of the public who has opted for public burial or decree, uh, deceased persons appointed again by the Speaker of the Council. So the language is, is open. Okay. We could, you know, add to that and what would be I think um, a each, good number then? Each committee should get to appoint three. Each committee that's involved each, in this legislation. Are you talking about city so council committee? Parks, um, parks? No, the parks. Yeah, city council committees. Uh -huh. Parks, health, um, transportation. Uh -huh. uh, those three committees, and I think the speaker should should also have some discretion. I think. So you know, you're looking at nine or more I members? Think so. I don't think, I just think because uh, what they presented today was really same old, same old, and they, for over 50 years, they've, ret they've refused jurisdiction. I think you have to take charge of this. You're the elected officials. These are city agencies. It's your job to assign them their job, and they, they're wiggling out of this. They're, there's, where is the city going to buy land for this? This means that there will no longer be city burials in New York City. They will be shipping out to New Jersey because they won't be able to meet the demands of New York State law to bury New York City residents outside of the city. It's just gonna to be too expensive. Natural burials upstate are quite expensive. So it's, it's, and all of the private cemeteries are running out of space. They've only got 15, per, you know, percent left to sell. So it costs, it's like $4,000 to get a burial space in Greenwood or Woodlawn, okay? Yeah. There isn't enough space. So this recycling of graves and whatnot that's the solution for New York City. And if you move these cemeteries way out, then how is the poor person going to visit it way upstate or way out in New Jersey? That's just another burden you're adding to people of color. So you would, you would like to have that, your views clearly represented um, I in more numbers on the task force. I want to fight for Island. I think it's a great task force. I think it's a great burial ground. I think it'll be the best in the United States. I think we've got the solution right here. We've got the laws in place, and we just need to work out a plan. And if the Parks Department can't come up with a landscape plan, they're not a very good Parks Department. Let's get better people on the Parks Department. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they can do this job, they just don't want to do this job. And that's been clear for over half a century. And, and, and I just you. want to jump, jump in, thank you. We, we, we haven't heard from the families yet, which we all want to do. Um, and I know, Commissioner, if you have a comment, then we'll, we'll go to the families. And I know some of the council members have follow-ups. I, I think it's important to hear from the people whose lives are 
directly affected by this? Um, Councilwoman Rose had asked about the language of the bill, so um, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I read through it. Um, you don't include public administrator's offices, and I understand why um, Staten Island is the only one that actually provides burials directly. Yes. But um, if they could still be actively engaged in the process, um, I don't know, maybe a focus group discussion or something, um, because they, they have a unique perspective um, because of the business that we're in yes. and I think um, could have valuable contributions to the process. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want you to know that we're still crafting this and um, so all of your um, comments are valuable and um, <clears throat> are, will be considered. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And, and, uh, We'd love to hear from the families. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tammy Martino. I am here today for my brother, Joseph Martino. who is buried on her island. I am also here for all the others buried there as well and their families. About 26 years ago, my brother died of AIDS at Beth Israel Hospital in Manhattan. He was 30 years old and a heroin addict who shared needles. When my mom and dad found out about it, they refused to claim his body and give him a proper burial with the family present. I protested their decision and decided to call funeral directors on my own and found out that they even, that even they wanted nothing to do with burying my brother. At the time, I felt extremely paralyzed because I couldn't claim my brother nor bury him. This was a very trying time for myself and my parents and caused a huge divide amongst my whole family. My mom and dad are divorced and we have not spoken in years. My brother was probably the most brilliant human being I have ever known. My parents were ashamed of him and couldn't deal with the fact that he had AIDS. In 1993, AIDS was a bad word. You couldn't even talk about it. In fact, my in-laws at the time wanted to quarantine my husband and I for six months because even they couldn't deal with the fact that my brother had AIDS. I am here today to say that I am not ashamed of my brother or anyone else buried on Heart Island, whether they are there for AIDS or whatever the reason may be. But what I will say is that I believe that all of the human beings on Heart Island deserve dignity and honor. The Department of Corrections has its place in the world, but it is not a funeral home nor a director of cemeteries and it certainly cannot provide people with the honor and dignity that every human being deserves when it comes to death and burial and maintaining a resting place for those souls. My hope is that all of you can see the importance of this project and how it will be a blessing to the families that have loved ones buried there now and for the families to come and also for the city of New York. Thank you for listening to me today and for your consideration to this project. May God shower his grace on the Heart Island Project. And I'd like to leave you with a Bible verse from Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. My goodness, thank you for speaking out and for your bravery. It's uh, really impactful to have you here with us and to make that statement. And we are very, very sorry for your loss. And we are doing everything in our power to make sure that your brother is afforded the respect and dignity that he deserves at his final resting place. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Elsie Soto, and I grew up in a New York City public housing not too far from here in the South, by the South Street Seaport. I am here today because my dad, Norbert Soto, was buried on Heart Island in March of 1993. 
He died of complications from AIDS. I'm sorry. I began visiting his grave, plot 231, section two, last year. The ride over was actually very nice. It was calming and relaxing. Then we got to Heart Island. It was, I feel, very harsh. The whole demeanor of the Cor Department of Corrections, because you have to get into a, you know, a prison bus and you're just kind of bussed around. It just doesn't feel like you're going to visit a family member who is buried. You don't feel a sentimental connection. Where my father is buried, specifically, is at the foot of the island. As you know, most of the AIDS patients are buried there. A lot of the headstones are knocked over or broken, da or broken down. And then they couldn't really tell me exactly where he was buried. It's just a big area. You just kind of like lay your flowers <laughs> I felt like it needed more of a personal connection to him. Instead of, oh, just stand here, he's just buried there. Like they were looking at a paper, and I'm like, that's my dad, you know? He's a person, he's loved, he's always loved, and he's never been forgotten. My father Norbert was always present in our lives. Even though his relationship with my mom was not always the greatest, he was still very present. I always knew who my father was. I always knew my dad loved me. I knew he was around for us. I remember one day that he took me, my brother, and my best friend to the park, and even though my best friend's father was very present, they lived together, she told me, you know, you're so lucky because your dad takes you to the park. <clears throat> my dad is there every day, but he doesn't take me. The thing is, I never had any documentation on him. I never had his social. It if it wasn't for his death certificate, I wouldn't have known half the information. I believe I was around nine years old when he got sick. My mom didn't divulge any AIDS until after the fact. He didn't speak of AIDS either. He just mentioned that he was very sick and that he didn't know if he was going to get better. <laughs> Within two years, he passed. He passed very rapidly. I know my mom is having a hard time. I know my mom was having a hard time finding a funeral home to take him. We had one right next door to my school. It was literally connected, and we spoke to him about it, and they were very hesitant, hesitant about taking him once they found out that he had AIDS. And then they started telling her, oh, you know, because he was sick, we have to handle his body differently, and that's going to be extra money. And my mom's just like, I only have but so much. She even, she had seven children at the time, and we had very limited help. It seemed like the only choice we had at the end of the day was to have him buried on Heart Island. Ultimately, that's where he went. They held on to him for about a month and a half. He died on February 1st, and they buried him on March 23rd. And I don't know if they used him for studies or if they took his organs. I don't. I have so many questions that I feel are unanswered. I would really like to have our island become a public park because that is how I wish his funeral, his burial site to be remembered by my children, a place where I can tell them about my dad taking me to play. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Ms. Soto. Thank you. For your bravery as well and for your eloquence and for speaking out. Thank you. And we're sorry for your loss. Thank you. Good afternoon, City Council members. I am sorely disappointed that members of the administration are not here to hear the compelling stories of myself and other family members, because we're the ones who really count. We're the ones this is all about, not pieces of paper floating around and bills and all that. That's all fine, but we're the ones who are basically affected by all, all of these uh, administrative rules and regulations. My name is Elaine Joseph. I am testifying here for the third or fourth time in front of the City Council on behalf of the million souls buried on Heart Island and the many relatives and friends that have been restricted to visiting their resting places due to the very strict and minimal visiting days provided by the Department of Correction. Back in March of 2014, I was the lawsuit. I was the first person to be granted permission to visit the gravesite of my infant daughter, who died in 1978. 
Her body was lost during a snowstorm between the hospital and Emmy's office. I was unable to locate her whereabouts till 2009 when I saw a story on Eyewitness News about the Heart Island Project. I looked up Miss Melinda Hunt and she helped me connect. We never found my daughter's burial records because they were lost. There was a handwritten volume of a thousand babies that is now non-existent. So we don't have the exact spot, but Ms. Hunt was able to guesstimate a GPS location of what trench my daughter and her 999 little friends are buried in. For the past five years, I've had to endure scheduling a visit to Heart Island through the penal system. Visits are only one day per month, alternating Saturdays, Sundays, and I had to sign up many months in advance. They say 12 days, it's 12 months. I have documentation, email documentation from them. When I went to put in for 2019, she said I had to hurry up because the 2019 days are already filled and she let me know which ones were available. So that's not true. It's a humiliating experience to have to list my guest name so far in advance and up to four guests only. Schedule changes happen over time. Over a year's time, people have different things they have to do. And the, if I'm scheduling them a year in advance and something comes up on that day or they get sick, they can't go. So even up to the last minute, schedule changes occur. People have to make changes. This has now become so stressful because if you don't notify the Department of Correction in advance, you're a no-show. After two of these no-shows, you're punished by, being, by only being able to visit if there's a cancellation and you're placed on a wait list. There's no way to contact them if due to illness you can't make it on that day. Because it's a DOC property, our cell phones are confiscated or you can leave them in your vehicle. Our IDs are checked. We have to sign in and sign a waiver. A CO accompanies every family to the gravesite and stands there while the family is grieving. Up until recently, they would stand there with their hand on their weapon as I'm standing over the grave of my baby. It was not comfortable, not at all. I am angry, as you notice, I am angry. This has to change. It can't change next year. I've been doing this for 10 years now. I want to change next week. Work on that, please. Um, there's nowhere to sit or seek shelter from the weather. You stand for an hour and a half while they go around in a bus collecting all the rest of the people. Heart Island is a public cemetery and therefore should be open to the public as any other cemetery is. I am a 23-year veteran and officer of the United States Navy and it would also be very important to me to be able to visit the Civil War Memorial on the island and pay respects <clears throat> to the many military members buried on Heart Island. Please, please understand that grieving the dead is a human right. Please place the jurisdiction of Heart Island in the hands of the Department of Parks or other department which can be made open to the public. Think about the last time you visited a loved one's grave. I'm certain we did not share the same experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Joseph, for your years of advocacy and for being so present around the City Council and these deliberations. It's been incredibly impactful. And uh, for the record, I think we have uh, the Parks Department is still here, uh, Commissioner Maturi and perhaps, and representatives of and DOT and DLC, Answer HRA. I'm glad they're here. Mr. Herbert? Yes. <clears throat> yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, I want to just give thanks to the committee that formed here today and also our public. I'm here today as just a human being first. Yes, everything you heard today from the people sitting here with me and a few people that gave reports prior to us. A lot of it has been true. But I'm truly here because of the embarrassment of the honor that I need to give 
to the veterans that have fell. We just went through a week of the fleet is in and Memorial Day. And I don't know what Memorial Day means to you, but to myself and everyone that has ever served in any army in the world recognizes the honor and respect that we give to our dead. The words is, lest we forget. This is very important because it gives me the understanding of how I'm going to be received when I leave. Yes, I have a daughter that was buried in Hart Island in 1967. And to this day, I have never visited her grave, simply because she's not there anymore. So what do they do with me? They do the same thing to me as they do to my comrades that have fall fallen in the past. They hide the truth. You just heard a veteran sitting beside me speak that she has not visited the gravesite of those veterans that are buried there. It's very combobulated what this particular island holds. As you heard today, chairman and members of your council, very intriguing but yet mystifying but yet dysfunctional situations that occur during this burial procedure. And some you, I didn't hear today, mention what they do with these cadavers. But at the same time, you must fix this problem. You heard how we have to humiliate ourselves in coming before the situation of the Department of Corrections to see and to behold and to give the honor to these graves, to our family members, to our comrades. I had the fortune of visiting this particular plot that is over there for the veterans. I hope when you visited Chairman of the Board, Mr. Rodriguez, that you saw that plot. And in seeing that plot before my comrade sitting beside me didn't see that plot, but in it should be open to the public and that's what we're asking you to do. To open this Hot Island, to free the souls and to free the the mindset of one that needs to visit and respect the dead. Give honor to those that have served. Give honor to those that have died at pre-birth, at birth, the children of the poor. You asked the question today. I've listened to your agencies that sat here and gave you answers that you were right who mentioned some heads need to roll. Why? Because they were lying to you. Why? Because a, con a, 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 a councilman sitting to my right mentioned a few serious factors. This is terrible. Like I said again, everything she said happened to me. The gazebo. Do you know what that gazebo do to a person standing there? I don't think so, unless you're waiting to identify with who you're over there to see. When we went in front of the federal judge Broderick a few years back, I spoke. And, and he offered his condolences and the, and the situation to where I could visit <coughs> Hart Island was the first time that I ever had the opportunity to visit Hart Island, but I stood in that gazebo. 
by myself trying to understand what am I here for? That gazebo is a torture. It's a torture. And then when you don't get the exact truth, which the city should really have the truth because I want to take you back to 1860 when the Civil War started. You talked a little bit today about the history of Hart Island. Well, lo and behold, you started at 1869. That's when the city took over. But the previous years, it was run by the Union Army. And there is where the first United States colored troops were mustered in to serve this United States of America today. You asked another question what coincides with that statement, and that is, what is the percentage of the cultures that are buried there? the race of the people that are buried there. And lo and behold, we all should understand that because it's crystal clear. Just like when you discovered the graveyards of Lower Manhattan, it's the graveyards of people of color, the depressed, the abandoned, the weak, the poor. That's who's buried in Hart Island, basically like 80%. Now we come to the same situation. Well, what about our soldiers? Again, it's a too proud thing with me. I need the answers to exactly why I can't visit this plot. But yet, we mention a name today who kind of is on the island, but I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want no problem for him or her, but they took me to that plot. And they told me, this is a plot where the soldiers were buried. But yet, he explained, or she explained, that there's another plot. And lo and behold, that plot belongs to the people of color. That the burial during those 10 years prior were hidden. In other words, what happened is you had segregated burial. And with that, that meant that the soldiers of the United States colored troops were buried in a different area. These are things we need for you to understand, find out, and bring it back to us so that we can honor these people properly and not play games with these hearings, which I was at the last hearings also. Yes, sir, you have that. Thank My name is Herbert Sweat. If you need me, find me with the American Legion's post that belongs also, as she said, to the organizational friends who are burying veterans. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Herbert. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know that Councilmember Rodriguez has a question. And Based on, of course, like all the feeling in this room and so much uh, history and for son of all's compassion because we can never understand. You know, as a father of two daughters, uh, part of a large family, as someone being raised Catholic, how important it is to go to a burial site, you know, family members. And those of us who follow similar faith, you know, the importance to be in peace when you visit it a loved one being buried in a particular area. I think that we are, first of all, we are in the po at a point where we need to recognize. We never thought that we would be here because as Melinda led in this effort, we know, you know, uh, Melinda, uh, Elizabeth Crowley, you know, and other, they were the one who championed also from the council. You know, the bill that I carry on today was her bill. And you know that you took a loss and you know the role that you had to play. And I feel that even though, in, and I said before, I, is, I cannot forget, you know, just taking the boat and going to the island. 
And yes, there's not a space for 50 people. It's a, it's a big boat. And as I look at the schedule of visitor to Governor's Island, like no one should have to go through a procedure to reserve a space to go to the island. And we should not wait for, for the bill to pass. I would like to see the mayor using executive order now yes. and announcing that starting next week, the vote will be running in a schedule. When we look at it, say, Governor's Island, from Manhattan, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 3 p.m., 3.45, 4.15. If we do like a pilot project, the mayor announced executive order working again, even before we transfer to park, it's about changing the way of how. No one should be leaving the cell phone. No one should be you no know, request to put a name in the list to go there. Let's do a pilot project. Let's see how it works. Let's announce that starting X day, the Hart Island will be running in a different schedule. That this is a schedule, not a once a week, every day on this hour. And let's see how the public respond, from the family to the loved one. <coughs> and then we can measure about how much more we have to do on capacity. Like, even if you say, opening to what there's, this is the moment to do it. Because as we are holding this hearing today, we are negotiating the budget. If it will mean that, that, that more resources should be allocated now to have more staff, that they should be you know, dealing with some building that they, are, uh, they also provide some safety issue, then we should have enough resources to be sure that as anyone go there, taking this ferry at this time, it's 15 minutes or whatever time, it's there. Five minutes. So, I, again, my, that's my comment, but my question to you is, how do you feel if we advocate for the mayor to use his executive power to giving another order to, even if it's correctional right now, that continue until we pass this bill? Like because of the urgency, how do you think is what change will it make if we establish, if we start first calling on the mayor to use executive order to allow family and members of the public to go to Hart Island without a need to put the name in any list? Well, here's the here's the thing, is that <coughs> the same ferry was used by Phoenix House and by the city back when there was 24-7 ferry service. So it's the same boat that took everybody back and forth back when there was a regular ferry service. The difference now is that the Department of Correction factors in the time it takes to go from Rikers Island to Hard Island. So for correction officers, if they're working an eight-hour day, they start at Rikers, and it takes two hours to get to the ferry dock. Then they're over there for four hours, and then they come back, and it's two hours back to Riker. So basically, it's all organized around these correction officers working eight hours a day for the city, and that's what their contract is. So you have to change the jurisdiction in order to expand the hours because the Department of Correction restricts access and they feel they need to follow their protocol for security, the same security at Rikers as on Hart Island. So it's just like visiting somebody in jail. They need that level of security where, you know, I've been on the island where there's basically one correction officer for every two people. These are, these are taxpayers that they're guarding from visiting their relatives. So you've, you've, you're using correction officers' salaries to uh, escort people to grave sites. 
and correction officer salaries are quite expensive because they're paid to do a dangerous job. But how, Melinda, and how I would say I will leave the logistic to, uh, by no mean I, I will compromise my two bill, which one is to transfer the control and jurisdiction from correction to park. In my idea, I, I see those buildings being turned down and being rebuilt as a, mu as a museum. It does in a, in a, in a long-term plan, but I say, so I mean, those four bills, they start, I can speak from my, the two that I have, the one transferring from correction to park, and the one on putting a plan of, of transportation, <coughs> offering ferry from Manhattan to Queens also as another option is the plan. My thing is that even if we leave the logistics right right now, and, and for the meantime, until we address the details about the bills, I feel that if we at least start changing and giving flexibility of the schedule for people to, again. Yeah, but the, the, what you heard today was the city agencies creating a lot more obfuscation of this issue. The Department of Transportation saying, well, we have to look at the dock, and this it's the same dock and the same ferry that they used in the 60s, and that's what they're using. So, and, and then parks, now they're gonna go, be looking at other lands and other cities that aren't even in New York State, and all of this stuff that they're just throwing up all, all of these issues that weren't even there. That, you know, so do I think you can just start? No, not if you don't have the mayor who's actually behind it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, really, the te testimony was very, very compelling. I want to thank everybody for testifying, and you, you really have our condolences. We'll call the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we have, I'm gonna butcher these names, Brenda Progaska, Kathy Sabek, uh, Kathy Sweat, She was. Do I need to do it with him? Yes, please. So we have Amy Copper also? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Okay, whenever you're ready. Well, sure, sure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, council members, for allowing me to speak today. I'm speaking to you regarding transferring Hart Island to the Parks Department. As a City Island resident, member of the Civic Association, the Chamber of Commerce, and a longtime volunteer in the community and visitor to Hot Island in June of 2015 and, and many times in my youth during the 60s and 70s. The process for visiting was not daunting. A response date to visit was given within two days. The island was well manicured at the time of my visit. It was peaceful and serene as it should remain to show the respect for those buried there. Therefore, I am opposed to Hart Island becoming a public park because that seems to be the trend since the last meeting. 
I realize the community board and 44 members of our civic, 1% of the city island population, have approved of this when the transfer was just to allow mourners increased visitation and not a public park. Since 2016, the community was enlightened to the fact that a full-fledged public park was the desired goal. Most city island residents are not in favor of this. I'm here representing the over 800 pe people who have signed the petition in opposition to a public park. The city island community became aware of the proposal to transfer Hart Island from the Department of Corrections to the Parks Department when we were urged to write to Community Board 10 in support of the transfer to prevent the city from using the land for prison, prisons, homeless shelters, incinerators, uh, fear tactics, which we know now is not the case. The city plan, uh, is planning for closing of Rikers is to place prisons close to the courthouses. We are a small community. When there is a major shift which would impact the community, we have a large public forum such as the City Island Bridge, the Firehouse, etc. For this we did not, and most city, city islanders were caught un unaware with this having already been passed by Community Board 10. Since that time, many articles have been published after these votes advocating for a public park or national monument comparing what could be to, to other former potters fields that are now successful public parks, such as Madison Square Park and Governor's Island, which is, was also referred to as a Sunday picnic in the park. We don't want this, which would lead to full public access to Hart Island. In the 1970s, Hart Island was home to Phoenix House. On certain Sundays, the island was open to the public. It, was, it wreaked havoc in our small community and on the residents, residents of East Side Fordham Street. Uh, on the east side of City Island were disturbed, their quality of life disturbed, was adversely affected. This is what led to the petition opposing the transfer to Parks Department since the bill has no parameters. A potter's field is a burial ground which should be considered sacred and not turned into a full-fledged public park. We have no problem with access granted to the site for respectful remembrance but we have not heard how the Parks Department plans to guarantee the maintenance of the due respect that we owe to these buried souls. The only viable access to Hart Island is via Fordham Street Ferry Terminal on City Island in the Bronx. Fordham Street is extremely narrow with no room for constant two-way traffic and no space for public parking in the immediate vicinity of the ferry terminal. Adding traffic will only jeopardize the public safety of island residents and visitors alike. As emergency access to the island is further further dangerously compromised. Even the DOC website and the N NYCLU lawsuit against the city for family access that the plaintiffs won cites because of extremely limited side street parking available in the vicinity of Hart Island Ferry Dock bordering a private residential area. Each group of visitors will be requested to coordinate travel to City Island Dock so as to bring as few vehicles to the site as possible. The amount of funds to clean up the island and prepare for public access would be enormous. It would include toxic cleanup, the abandoned missile silos, and raised buildings. Why not put these funds into Pelham Bay Park, which is adjacent to City Island and Hart Island. City parks can be used for a multiple, uh, multitude of activities that wouldn't be respectful to the dead. Skating rinks, concert venues, ball fields, which are all good things but not needed there or here next to the largest park in New York City. In addition, parkland can be alienated for a multitude of reasons. Rodman, Rodman's Neck is an example of alienated parkland. For such a small amount of residents in favor and few requests to visit Hart Island, why would the city or our community take on such a burden and expense of another public park? Thank you. And I also have um, our residents sign this petition. And that, that's it. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Kathy Sweat. I own a house on City Island. Today in this hearing is the first time hearing that the city wants to stop burying people on Hart Island. From reading the bills and seeing that there was an intention to transfer the jurisdiction to the Parks Department, nowhere in the legislation is it clarified any intention to stop the burials. And the people from the Parks Department who are here don't seem to have a plan to take over Hart Island. And it seems really um, foolhardy to transfer jurisdiction to the Parks Department when they're not ready to take it over. 
no one is here today who is a prisoner who has actually buried bodies on Hart Island. To work on Hart Island, and I have friends who have done this, to work on Hart Island burying prisoners as City Councilman Mark Jonai, who represents the district, uh, testified to his colleagues, you have to have perfect behavior. And you apply, it's competitive. One of my friends told me someone picked a fight with him at lunch because they were jealous that he was assigned to Hart Island. And by him being in this fight, he lost his job going to Hart Island. I wish you could bring some prisoners here because I know they would love to get a day off and have a field trip to come here and talk to you, just like they like getting released to go to Hart Island. I'm sure it's very hard work burying those boxes, but they're not handling bodies, and it is competitive. The prisoners want that job. Similarly, there is a horticultural program that is part of the Department of Corrections that it does work at Hart Island. They, there is not another place for the prisoners to landscape. Second to the horticultural education program at the Bronx Zoo, the one in the Department of Corrections is preparing people for careers, uh, not the Bronx Zoo, the Bronx Botanical Gardens, is preparing people for careers in the real world. Why do you want to take that away from people? This is a huge burdening industry of landscaping, horticulture, planting. It's second to genealogy and porn, taking care of your garden. Why do you want to take, it's not funny, it's true. Gardening as a hobby and investing in landscaping is huge. Why do you want to take that horticultural program out of the Department of Corrections and deny those prisoners? I wish someone from the prison here would, would be able to talk to this. Another thing that's a problem is, as was testified earlier, Fordham Street has one lane of traffic. Since the most recent time the city council considered doing this, 42 new single family homes are being constructed right next to the ferry dock. Another two family house got a permit to build on Fordham Street. There's already not enough parking. There was a fire department incident on King Avenue on Saturday. The fire trucks could not turn around. Four firefighters had to walk behind the fire truck and coax the truck to back up down a city block, which took like half an hour. If there was another call, how was that truck gonna respond? How are those firefighters gonna get to the next call? Took them half an hour to back down Fordham Street. So it's, it's ill-advised to create something where there's more traffic and more um, visiting to Hart Island. So in short, there are two bills sponsored, 1580 to do a burial study and 1559 for burial assistance. And those are very much needed. And we need to, there needs to be a plan to move forward. 906 and 909A are just really ill-considered. The Parks Department, they, was, they sat here. They have no plan to take this over. Why would you want to switch jurisdiction to the Parks Department in 180 days? One of the advocates for this uh, was telling the news media earlier that she thought the ferry should run regularly and that you should be able to kayak over to the island. No, you should not be able to kayak over the island. I'm a trustee of the cemetery that is on City Island, and we have such a huge problem keeping that cemetery clean from dog waste and picnicking. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it that people get takeout food, come in the cemetery, eat it, and leave a mess. We are considering limiting access to the public cemetery because of the dog feces on the graves and the picnicking. If you go to other cemeteries, you can't go whenever you want. Go to Woodlawn. They're going to inspect your bag. They're going to they're going to say, who are you visiting? Do you need a map? Where are you going? It's not you it, it's not as free and easy as everybody wants to say. Coming to this building here today, I had to go through security. I had to go through a metal detector to exercise my first amendment right of addressing you. The idea that the ferry which is the existing ferry that fixed fits into that terminal dock is ancient. It cost $83,000, if I did the math correctly, every time it goes back and forth, and someone testified that the average number of people who will show up to visit in a month is 12. 
why are we going to spend money to rebuild a dock so that the ferries from somewhere else can go there when only 12 people a month are expressing interest? I hope you'll do a burial study to figure out how things can be handled more respectfully at Hart Island. In 2016, when you decided to keep it in Department of Corrections, the City Council says a study needs to be done. It needed to be done in 16. It needs to be done now. The burial assistance program needs to be expanded. Thank you. But until there's a real plan, you need to keep this island with the Department of Corrections and don't let us kayak over there. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Amy Coplow and I'm the executive director of the Hebrew Free Burial Association. And um, I thank you for letting me speak for a few minutes with uh, very unprepared notes. Um, Hebrew Free Burial Association um, has been in existence in New York City since 1888. Um, we've buried over 65,000 people since then of the Jewish faith. We still do between 350 and 400 burials a year. Um, by taking care of um, our particular faith group, we save New York City from having to um, bury this piece of the indigent population. Um, I am very much, uh, I very much support um, this oversight hearing um, and um, the two bills, 1559 and 1580, um, that are um, looking into um, the uh, burial assistance and the situation with Indian, indigent burials. Um, what I want to address is um, HRA. Um, I'm, uh, unless I may be mistaken, I don't think there's anybody left here from HRA. Oh, there is? Okay. So we deal with HRA, um, and I was very happy to hear that they are going through uh, an internal review and audit processes. Uh, because it, um, although this $900 burial benefit is kind of out there for people, residents in New York City to um, apply for, um, it's very, very difficult. We have the status uh, of a friend of the deceased. We have that along with other organ agencies that help with indigent burials, including Catholic Charities and St. Vincent de Paul. I know for a fact that the Catholic Charities have bowed out of uh, going to HRA because it's become so difficult to um, obtain that $900. The, the other thing that uh, I, I would like to point out to uh, these council members is that although HRA, you know, it, it, it's kind of uh, the, it's kind of foggy where the nine hundred dollars comes from, but supposedly it comes from the state. If it comes from the state, why do Nassau and Suffolk counties um, contribute twelve hundred dollars towards an indigent burial? Um, Westchester also twelve hundred dollars. Dutchess County twenty six hundred dollars. Orange County twenty three hundred dollars. Um, Sullivan County, $2,800, and Rockland County, close to $1,600. Um, if any of you have been involved in trying to bury a relative, you know there is not very much you can do for $900. We, as a charity organization, depend on that $900 to subsidize the work that we do. Um, the, other, the, the, um, um, the other thing that I want to point out to the council members is that organizations like us get caught between the public administrators and HRA. HRA requires certain documentation to prove that somebody qualifies for the indigent burial benefit. Um, we've been turned down on, on homeless cases because we can't provide a household composition. Now just think about it. Someone's homeless, how would they possibly have a household composition? Sorry, Charlie, you don't, you know, you don't get the benefit. Um, and there are, are um, two public administrators in um, particular, I will not, I don't want to mention them, uh, in, uh, of the five boroughs, that will not cooperate with our applications to HRA. What they do is we, we, we get on our hands and knees and beg 
for them to release a Jewish case to us for burial. Um, it's usually somebody who's indigent. And then um, they do an investigation, especially if somebody has passed away in an apartment. So the public administrator has any bank account information or anything else on the person's assets, which HRA is requesting, and they, won't, they will not entertain the application without this, and we get told by a public administrator that they're, they're not our, um, our record collector or bookkeeper, and they refuse to turn over um, the information that we need for HRA. And I wish that there was some way in regards to um, helping out with, bur with indigent burials where um, there, there could be, um, man ma I would say, mandated cooperation between the public administrators and, um, and HRA. And I applaud Debbie Rose and um, Commissioner Martin, who were here, um, because they are fabulous to work with. And, and, and do uh, really have um, the, the ethics to stand behind um, and, and prove the ethics to stand behind um, dignified burials for all, which is not what happens in, in some of the other boroughs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilmember John. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do have a question regarding the traditional berries, burials for the Jewish religion. Yes. Um, embalming is not permitted, correct? Embalming is not permitted. Um, I can, I can des describe it to you in like please. <laughs> five seconds. Um, uh, the Jewish religion sort of believes some people should be buried sort of the way that they came into the, into the world. Everybody, whether they're rich, poor, is buried the same way in a simple pine coffin. Their bodies are prepared by um, a, a ritual washing. Um, that's called the Tahara, and people are buried in shrouds. And they're buried as soon after death as possible, which is another problem with the public administrators because they can delay an investigation for weeks. And, um, you know, therefore, we, we report a case to them and wait and wait and wait. And, you know, we're told, oh, two weeks, oh, maybe next month, you know, we have a big backup. Um, and that, and there, we we don't. Uh, cremation is not uh, the way, uh, the traditional way to bury people who are Jewish, um, and they're buried um, in their own grave, not not in a mass grave. So this actually interferes with your religious beliefs. The yes. time delay. Oh, yes. um, this goes back to Abraham and Sarah in the Bible, in the Book of Genesis. Thank you. I just wanted to point that out for the record and. Obviously, discuss this further uh, with the chairs as we uh, have a better understanding of the religious needs uh, and how we can meet their religious beliefs in the most sacred of practices, especially when it comes to burials. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Rodriguez. I I, I perfectly understand a concern for from some community board resident of that particular area when it comes to, okay, what does it mean? You're thinking about adding more people. Who are those people coming? How will that affect the food traffic? How will deal with safety? So my, I just want to be clear that in the way of how we see, first of all, we see the value of the history in that particular area. That's one, one thing that we give value to. Second, as you heard, 62% of people being buried in that cemetery, they was buried because the family, they didn't have the money. And as I say, as elected official, we know some of them, those families, they go to our office. And we connect them with the HIA, and if they will have the, a, enough assistance to bury those individuals in another cemetery, they will do that. Library in the Heart Island is like the last choice for people that didn't have the resources, for the homeless, or for the people that didn't have the loved one by the time when they die. I, so definitely something has to be done because people were starting burying that cemetery before 
many of our own family started coming to New York City. And when it comes to increasing the traffic and car and vehicle, in the bill that I, again, the two bills that I have, one is to transfer to park. Again, first, and, and for me to have conversation with you guys, the community board, and, and, and build the support with the resident specialist of, of City Island is important. But because park? You, because you are part you know, of that neighborhood. You have built that neighborhood there. But first of all, when, we, when I'm thinking about transferring to park, it's because no cemetery should be guarded by correctional. Second, when it comes to increasing people to the area, in my belief, in the way of how I see that area be reorganized and getting the resources that they need, transportation should also be offered from Queens and Manhattan. So I don't see as a, the members of the public in the city only connecting to to Hart Island from City Island. I, that's why we would like DOT and the other agency to work together and put together the transportation plan so that we can offer other options. So that's how we see it's not only about adding more uh, cars and people the, going to the area. The right? ferry that the ferry that goes to Hart Island now is compatible with the dock that is on the island. The ferries that are in use, like C Street and so forth, that are part of the network of ferries that have been put into action, they are not compatible with the dock on Hart Island. Yeah. And, so, and so, so, so the, the priority bill. needs to be, from all the testimony you heard today, you heard the Staten Island Commissioner talk about the priority of the dignified berries for the dead. You heard people sitting here whose family members were dead. And all of them spoke about the priority needs to be the dignity of the burials for the dead. Mm -hmm. The Parks Department doesn't seem to have any plan. Their only plan is that burials on this island need to stop. Maybe it does, but there's no other place in this city designated yet to put the bodies. Now, people have talked about green burials. I was born in a mother and children's home here in the Bronx. I was in foster care until I was five. If I died before I was five, I would be like all those other kids who are wards of the state who are buried in Hart Island. My adoptive parents spent so much money on lawyers. If I died when I was five or six, they wouldn't have had the money to bury me. I still would have been on Hart Island. The priority needs to be to do the studies under 1580 and 1559 and have a plan for the dignity of the dead. Right next to Hart Island is Pelham Bay Park and Orchard Beach, which are right now in the process. They all got public input from all the members of the community. How should Orchard Beach look in the future? They're putting together plans to improve access to the natural areas, to the beachfront. It's three times the size of Central Park. It's readily accessible by car and bus. Okay, and so if you don't mind, so, so let, let me... I'm just saying there needs to be a plan for the dead first. Yeah. Then, if that plan allows for burials somewhere else, then start thinking about making Hart Island a park. This is very disrespectful for the dead to say people are going to kayak over there. We saw what happened when, when the uh, drug treatment center on the island closed and the island was basically vacant and people would just go over to the island in so, steel so boats and vandalize. You heard testimonies about that. Hart Island is the only place, it's the potter's field for a million New Yorkers. It's the only place where the people who aren't buried by the various charities are still buried today and for as long as their capacity. There can be no change in that until there's a plan to take care of the dead. Okay, There's so a let me, lot of places to come. Okay, so let, let, me, let me explain to you. Uh, as my colleagues have been here, I can tell you that when we are in the middle of any bill, we are not far apart from many other occasions when we've been able to bring big changes, positive changes. So. The fact that we have the city saying we're ready to work with this 
in a city that I have to ask. But we don't have a plan yet. I know. We have a plan. They're miss, not ready. Leave it miss. with DOT. The DOT knows how to manage DOT. the grade. Okay, so it, so it might not be it might not be ideal. Okay, let, and, let me. But the the prisoners let, let me, let me, who are let, there let me now. To you. This is a good thing. The horticultural program in the Department of Corrections is a good thing. Why does that need to be taken away? Okay, let me There's explain. There's no other plan. Okay, let, let me. And please respect let me, our let me community. Ask, sorry, sorry. Let me explain to you. City live here. I can say high level leadership through different agency that they are sitting back there. The reason why they are still here, the reason why they also sent and from the park representative they say we are ready to work with this plan. We are not there, we, we, you're right. We don't have a plan yet. The transportation, the bill on transportation, what is calling for is DOT to put together a plan. In that plan, we will discuss it. Your representative, they will share with you. We will go back and forth. That plan can say transportation will be offered from Queens to Hart Island, from Manhattan to Hart Island. We don't know yet what the plan is, and you're right, we don't have the plan yet. It's however, plan however, someone, someone, a cemetery is not built from people correctional, law enforcement, to be the one escorting someone that wants to be spending peace time with a loved one. Yes, you can walk in different park here, and we'll be surprised in how many of those parks people have been buried in the past. So we do believe that we have an opportunity. We are not there yet, and you're right. And as a representative of City Island, you have the right to bring your concern about how there can be the increase of vehicles and people going there, who are those people going to that area. But the plan, I believe, will be Wait, let me work out in a way that will be good for everyone. May I ask a question, Councilman? Um, so is the plan for a full-fledged public park? Because with do all due respect, you're not the councilman from our district, Councilman Jonai is, and he is fully well aware of weekends on City Island during the summer months. We live there, visitors alike, access for our families. I have an 89-year-old mother. I have a husband with a heart condition, and we would like emergency vehicles to reach our community and the visitors. We have 30-something restaurants there, and you're just I feel like you're not listening about the public park aspect. All due respect to the people being buried, we believe that these people should visit more. No, who, who in their right mind would not think that they should visit their family more? I think Department of Corrections would be capable of allowing them more access now because the prisoners are only there during certain times during the week. So if they're allowed to go on Saturday and Sunday, I'm sure they can go on other Saturday and Sundays and other times of the week. And Maybe they should allow them to bring their cell phones. Maybe that's something that you could do right now to help these people visit their loved ones. No one that lives on the City Island community is opposed to it, nor our petition. But we said to access that island from our community, and I don't know if you've been to our community. Have you been there on a weekend? Have you sat there in the traffic? Have you seen the people zipping up and down a fire lane? And we have no, no, police presence a lot of times. Now we do because of Councilman Joe and I listen to, listening to our constituents. We are asking the city for a substation, but they don't have, we don't have resources for more police or a substation, but we're going to have resources to make a public park at Hart Island. I just find, I just find that crazy. Thank you. Build what the bill does is calling DOT working together with other agency to present a plan on transportation, and that plan can include offering also transportation from Queens or from Manhattan using ferry to go there. So it's not only adding more people to go from 
from Sili Asiri Island to Hart Island. That's what I wanted for you also to take as you will leave this hearing today, that the bill is calling for DOT to work with other agency to present a plan of transportation that it doesn't focus, it doesn't work limited only on people going from City Island to Hart Island. It can be that also it offer ferry from Manhattan to Queens so that we don't see an increase or bill because more people going from City Island in order to go to Hart Island. Those ferries don't fit though. It's to build new things. That's what I said. I wanted to. Is anyone still here from Department of Corrections? Because there can be, as part of bills 1580 and 1559, that study can consider how to have the visits of people supervised by bereavement counselors or by others. It doesn't. It does not necessitate moving the entire jurisdiction of this sacred island to the Parks Department. No, it's not adding new ferry without building infrastructure. When we talk about transportation, it's not only, if the plan go through, it's not only for people to go from City Island to Hart Island. And in order to see a major investment there, they have to have a commitment from the administration to do that. So we are not in the final step with the plan. This is only a start where City Hall already say, we are committed to work with you with this plan. We are ready to continue conversation, and definitely you will play a role because you are the residents of that area. Who had a question you. about Thank green you for burials? Your testimony. Did someone have a question about green burials? I don't believe there was a question there. I think Councilman Rodriguez made a statement. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next panel is Judith Birdie, Barbara Dolnesik, Tom Wagner, David Werb, and Rabbi Regina Sandler Phillips. Uh, if we can also call up Randolph Waterman and Karen Emis. Okay. Please. Oh, sorry. Hello, uh, my name is Barbara Delensek and I live on City Island. Um, a longtime resident and I'm vice president of the City Island Historical Society. As also, and also an officer of the uh, Civic Association, which in, in 2014 voted to support a previous bill uh, to transfer Hart Island from the Department of Corrections to um, parks. Uh, and that was followed in 2015 um, by a virtually unanimous decision of the Community Board 10 also to support that bill. Some residents of City Island have raised objections to this new bill, and I agree with their concerns about the additional burden that open access to Hart Island can cause for City Island. However, I support the current bill for the following reason. In 2018, I submitted an application to the New York State Historic Preservation Office to place Hart Island on the National Registry of historic places. The state of New York confirmed that Hart Island is definitely eligible for that designation. However, the Department of Correction has made it very clear that they will not support this application. Many do not realize that Hart Island has been a cemetery since Civil War, and that after it was bought by the city of New York in 1868, it became a potter's field run by the Department of Charities and Correction. The department was divided in 1896, and the Department of Correction was left in charge. Most of the, uh, the island's historic buildings have been allowed to deteriorate, 
Much of its natural landscape, including graves, have been damaged by storms. Burial records have been destroyed by vandals, and the general public may not visit, as we have heard, without special permission from DOC, which handles visitors in the same way that they handle visitors to prisons. The Department of Parks and Recreation would be obligated by its mission to either restore or remediate the conditions there and to treat visitors in the same welcoming way that Woodlawn Cemetery and other city cemeteries do. Some of those who object to the Parks Department jurisdiction fear that the island would become a popular attraction for tourists like Orchard Beach, drawing thousands of visitors. But I believe that Hart Island is a cemetery and an important historic site, and the Parks Department would be obliged to treat it with respect as such. The Parks Department is fully aware of what's on Hart Island. They have done a serious study with the Department of Buildings of all of the structures there. They also, from time to time, do landscaping, which is beyond uh, what the prisoners can do. However, those who don't want Hart Island to become a tourist destination raise a serious concern that must be addressed, since City Island now offers the only access to the island and cannot accommodate additional traffic or parking problems. I believe that anyone who wishes to, build a, to visit a public cemetery should be allowed to do so, but I hope that the year-long study of transportation options offered by this bill will result in the conclusion that a ferry from City Island is not the only viable option for, and it not for visitors. There's no space for parking. Traffic onto City Island is already overwhelming on weekends, and City Island is a largely residential community that is not suitable for access to a cemetery. Furthermore, there's no reason why ferry service conveying workers and coffins to Hart Island has to originate on City Island, a practice dating back to when the construction of the FDR eliminated ferry service from Bellevue Hospital. The dock on City Island was used by residents who worked on City Island, but that is no longer the case. Some combination of ferry service from other locations would not only be desirable, but necessary. After City Island residents went to court in 1985 to protest the presence of prisons on the island, it was resolved that the state environmental restrictions do not permit the city to house inmates there, and the prison that was there as recently as 1991 was closed as a result. So there's no justification for the Department of Correction to be present on Hart Island, let alone manage the burials there. Um, some who object to the bill explain that the Parks Department is already seriously underfunded, and this is certainly true. FEMA has provided funds to restore the shoreline on City Island to address the problem of skeletal remains washing into Long Island Sound, not on City Island, though. This work is now beginning and will provide a significant start to landscape restoration, but there's a great deal more work to be done before visitors will be even allowed to visit the island. Capital funding would enable the demolition and restoration of buildings, and a modest increase in parks operating budget would cover the cost of landscape maintenance. Burials can and should be managed and funded by the medical examiner's office or a related city agency. Thank you for your time. Is it on? Thank you, good afternoon. I'm Rabbi Regina Sandler Phillips, Executive Director of Ways of Peace Community Resources. I have worked as a funeral consumer advocate for the past 20 years to reclaim traditional, sustainable burial practices as quiet acts of justice and kindness. Often identified as green today, these practices are upheld with minor variations by both Jews and Muslims throughout the world. I dedicate this testimony to the memories of two community burial leaders whose lives were violently cut short of, of recent months but whose legacies of love and kindness shine on across our lines of diversity. Dr. Jerry Rubinowitz of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Ms. Husna Ahmed of Christchurch, New Zealand. A Jewish funeral is called levaya, which literally means accompanying. Traditionally, levaya begins, as you've heard from Amy Kaplow, at the time of death as a process that honors and protects both the human body and the earth. 
We wash, watch over, cleanse, dress, and lay out the dead in simple biodegradable garments and coffins. We accompany the dead to their graves, and we pick up shovels to participate in their burials. We return later to mark the graves, visit, and remember. Accompanying the unclaimed dead is a supreme Jewish imperative, and I'm very glad that you have heard about the exemplary work of the Hebrew Free Burial Association over almost as many years as Heart Island has been active. Today, my support for Hebrew Free Burial and my support for Heart Island are integrally connected, and that is because the same time-honored ethical principles that call for sustainable, egalitarian, participatory Jewish burial in Hebrew, mipnei kvodam shel aniim, for the honor of the poor, also call for cooperative mobilization of resources in our cities of diversity so that neighbors of all backgrounds may be buried with honor. Mipne darche shalom, for these are ways of peace. The most integrated solutions to the challenges of Heart Island actually point toward the most equitable and sustainable choices facing all of us at death. I believe this is reflected in the city council bills under consideration. I would add my support to having more community advocates and other members of the public on the Interagency Task Force. There is a lot of wisdom that has been accumulated over the decades about this, and we can all do better by coordinating and cooperating. Because the honor of the dead is not an isolated funeral product, but rather an ongoing process of building community across all the lines that too often divide us. I was privileged to visit Heart Island in September 2017, and I want to express my gratitude for all that has brought us to this point, for the solidarity of anonymous prison inmates who built monuments to honor those they buried, for the loving courage and tenacity of Heart Island family members, friends, and community activists, and for the stewardship and accompaniment of supportive municipal representatives through decades of challenge and change. All of these have brought us to this historical moment of opportunity for justice and kindness to come together off the coast of the Bronx and beyond. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Joy. Thank you, Chairman. As you can see, um, there are rightfully so. We've heard from so many and very passionate ways. I think above all, unilaterally, the opinion has been that we must do something to stop the deterioration of the land making sh preventing bones or the remains of loved ones and the unknown and the less fortunate from washing out into Long Island Sound. This must be the priority. Then we can focus on which agencies, if any other agencies, should be taking over Hearts Island. But if we lose focus on how we get there and who's going to be driving the ferry and where the ferry's coming from and who has access without prioritizing the basics of protecting the remains of those that are buried there, we will lose focus and get caught up in the weeds. And I respect that all of you agree with me on this priority and w adhering to the wishes of all. Access is important. Family members must have available access to the cemetery and the burial of their loved ones. But the priority has to be, first and foremost, the remains. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very okay. much for your testimony. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our final panel, Greg Waltman. All you. If, if we could just ask him to fill out a slip. Oh, we, call, we did call him. L. David Webb, Korean, Vietnam veteran, retired 25 years, served on the front line in Korea. I've been to Hard Island. 
when Hurricane Sandy came through, it uncovered and tore up grave sites, and there was femur, human femur bones showing there. I suggest that this should be turned over to the park department where they have the proper people to tend and allow families to visit their loved ones where they can bring flowers, put flags out like on Memorial and like on Veterans Day. But this, where they can show and uh, tend to the grave sites. I think that this should be turned over to the park department, whether it's the national, come on in the national park and they tend to it. I've been to where we have in Washington, Alaska, and Arlington, these graves of the unknowns, and they are tended to by loved ones and visitors and give the proper respect. I thank you. Mr. Webb, thank you for your service and your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Chairs, council. Um, after hearing the heartfelt testimony of so many today, um, I was sitting there thinking, reworking the problem in my mind, and it seemed that there's one of many problems. On one hand, you have uh, Department of Corrections and people that are about to be assimilated back into society wishing to get jobs there so they can, you know, obviously ease in that transition. And then on the other side, you have people of City Island who see it as a traffic issue. So then you maybe go to Pelham Park, which is right next to it, and perhaps offer ferry service from Pelham Park, which is private, separate from corrections, where you're now separating corrections and, and that type of issue from the public, and then resolving your traffic issue. And, you know, in, in the spirit of this debate, which seems that it's gone on for quite some time, but due to lack of funding, we find ourselves here now addressing it. Hopefully, the clean energy initiatives have sparked a revitalization of different types of budgetary concerns like this, and these concerns are now coming to fruition in this transition, whether it be Hart Island to the Parks Department or any a variety of issues. But Again, touching upon on that in its clean energy in that type of context, again, just making sure that um, parsing through the Green New Deal and the value-based hyper-protectionism within the media and within the council, and um, uh, it, it just becomes imperative to be able to make sure that the mainstream public is aware of the um, actual solutions, not merely illusion of solutions that value wishes to impose upon not only this council, but the general public in being able to advance these causes successfully. So with that, I would like to leave you and thank you. Uh, again, thank you both for your testimony. Uh, this concludes this joint hearing. Thank you very much.